Uh, good morning. Can I welcome everyone to the 16th meeting of the Education and Skills Committee in 2017? Can I please remind everyone present to turn their mobile phones and other devices onto silent for the duration of the meeting? I'm very keen uh, that the business of the meeting goes ahead as normal, but uh, before we begin, I would like to add this committee's support to the statement made by the presiding officer, the First Minister and other party leaders yesterday in the Chamber in relation to the Terrorist Act in Manchester. Uh, given our role as dealing with the, the, the future of young children, I also think it, it would be appropriate for us to have a moment of reflection for those who were injured and lost their lives in that dreadful event. We've received apologies from Tavish Scott, MSP, who is on a Commonwealth Parliamentary Association visit. The committee has one piece of negative subordinate legislation to consider today. This sub-legislation that the committee has to consider is on the Academic Awards and Distinctions University of the Highlands and Islands, Scotland, Order of Council 2017, brackets 2017 slash 146. Does the committee have any comments to make on this instrument, Liz? Have any comments to make, but uh, I, I do think it's a, a very welcome development. Uh, this um, or related issues have been before this committee many times, um, and I know it's been a very detailed process. So to get to this stage, I think it's very good news. I think the committee should note. Thank you very much. The second item. Sorry, anybody else get any comments? Thank you. Uh, the second item of business is our third evidence session of the committee's inquiry into teacher workforce planning for Scotland schools. Today we will hear from a selection of organisations on the Teacher Workforce Planning Advisory Group. For the, first, for the first panel, can I welcome Alan Armstrong, Strategic Director of Education Scotland, Cathy Cameron, Policy Manager of COSLA, Greg Dempster, General Secretary of AHDS, Martin Fairburn, Chief Operating Officer and Deputy Chief Executive of the SFC, Dr Morag Redford, the Chair of the Scottish Council of Deans of Education, John Stoddart, Representative ADES and Jim Thiolis, General Secretary, SLS. Thank you all for, giving, for agreeing to give evidence to the committee. As standard, I'll kick us off with the first question, which is, how best can we link workforce planning at a local level with the national setting of ITE targets? Would anybody like to begin? Happy to set the ball rolling on that, Kavina. Uh, last year, for the first time, more of the local information was used in a very productive way to try and inform the process. Uh, I think one of the issues is the vacancies count, and for a number of years that vacancies count has been increasing, but there was never a, a, a formal or robust way of actually putting a number on, on the vacancies, because you have, to, you have to interpret what a vacancy is, when is a vacancy a long-term vacancy or a long-standing vacancy, and at what point of the year do you actually do this? So a survey was done. It was Causal that carried out that survey. Uh, so one of the issues would be to make that more robust and maybe even to try to get it to a state where you can put a number on it and add that number into the intake. Just now it's used as background intelligence as opposed to fundamental and central to, to the, the model. There's also the issue of supply teachers. And again, for a number of years, the idea's view on the group has been that that has been being depleted. And you, you have heard already of the difficulties that creates in terms of time in the school, pressure on uh, teachers and head teachers, and so on. So again, I think uh, a, a, you know a more rigorous and careful look at the supply pool, uh, who's in the supply pool, because there are different types of teachers with different attitudes in terms of how, how much work they're prepared to do. Uh, some authorities have permanent supply pools, and every two years they they might well be refreshed. Uh, they'll go into maybe full-time permanent posts in a school, and then uh, they've, they've obviously earned the right to do that, and, and the, the pools would be would be supplemented again. So I think all of that I would put in the category of the, the real formalisation of the local intelligence. So instead of it just informing the model, maybe try and bring it much more into the model by by a more robust, more rigorous look at those issues. I think also a full account of new demands, uh, because there are continually new initiatives, whether it's STEM, modern languages in the primary school, uh, the pupil equity funding, attainment challenges, 
all these issues. There are always curriculum changes, curriculum uh, developments, and it's not always clear how these will, even curriculum for excellence, for example, it changes the pattern of subject choice in secondary, it changes the nature of the, of the curriculum. So a more detailed account of how these actually impact on schools on the ground, how they timetable and, and what it means for the number of teachers and, and indeed the types of teachers and the subjects. Uh, so I think these are some areas where we could uh, make more robust and more informed uh, local intelligence in terms of the, the, the national planning model. And, and that is a trick. We've got a national planning model, but the actual staffing is managed, delivered uh, uh, locally in, in each of the 32 authorities. So the issue is how you actually ma marry these two things together. I think I'm going to come back to that later on. But the, can, can I just ask one question based on that? The, you said you, how to interpret a vacancy. Why is that a difficult well, a vacancy thing? Could, uh, it's such a large system that any day you ask an authority, have you got vacancies, they'll say yes, there will be vacancies. Some of them will be filled within a week. Some of them will, t will be filled within a month. Some of them may be longer than that. So it's trying to define exactly what is a long-term vacancy, because those are, the one, those are the ones, presumably, that you need new people to fill rather than uh, existing people. Uh, so it's just to do with the, the churn. It's, it's a big system, and there's a lot of movement. On any one day, the number of pupils will be different. On any one day, the number of teachers will be different. And on any one day, the number of vacancies will, will, will change. And is there any work being done to kind of create a process that would make that much yeah. more simple? Because it does seem a very complicated uh, and murky method. I, I wouldn't say it's murky. It is certainly complex. Uh, maybe Cathy from COSLA, uh, who's been working on trying to get that data uh, and it's a question of timing as well. When do you actually do it? Okay. Yes, I mean, I would agree with John. It's, it's a, a complex exercise. And um, when we agreed with government to carry out this survey last year, it was done, I suppose, at a time when um, obviously we were coming up to the teacher census when the, the information is gathered um, from councils at the end, rough, roughly towards the end of September. And what it was decided was that in order to try and not place too great a, um, a pressure on councils to gather this information, that we would carry out that exercise at roughly the same time, so it didn't require gathering the information twice. Um, but it was a complex process. Um, it took some time to gather in all the information. And I think, in retrospect, probably there were some questions weren't asked in quite the, the right way. So. As with everything, there's always scope for refinement and reflection on these things. So if we are going to carry out that exercise again, one of these things you know, we'll have to have early conversations about so that we can get the right, right questions asked. OK, thank you. Was you wanted to come in? Next? Yes, just, just very briefly. Can I just be quite clear about this? Is there a definition of vacancy rate that you accept as being uh, adequate? I think that's still that that is one of the issues. It's how you interpret. Uh, if you're asked how many vacancies have you got and how long have you had them, there are different interpretations about you know, what is what is a genuine vacancy, and what is is just a post that's that's just about to be filled. So I think there is still some work on getting a definition that you can ensure that the data that's put in is absolutely robust and consistent. Uh, so, so when, is, is when there's a publication of vacancy rates across different local authorities, are they using different definitions and different measures? Well, it, they've never been asked in, in very specific, hard detail, you know, how many vacancies do you have at this point of time in the way that the, the pupil census is done. It took many years for the pupil census <coughs> approach to be uh, so uh, firm and robust that there was very little possibility of misinterpretation. And I think the same process would have to be gone through for the for the the vacancies. Right. It, so it was, so when, it done, when we it was done for the first time last year as part of this exercise to try and establish what the vacancy rate was, and it was something that Ades had been pushing for in terms of uh, making sure we had that bit right before we embarked on trying to plan for the new teachers. Right. So when we are given vacancy rate statistics, are you saying that they're not accurate? I don't know whether accurate would, would be the answer to that. It, it, it depends on who filled in the form, how they interpreted what the vacancy was, and, the, and, and when you've got many different people putting in different data, 
the, the issue is how you make sure that the, uh, the, the answers they give are robust and reliable, and the, the point at which they do them is, is also important. Joanne wants to ask a question. Now, let's, but let's not get hung up on this one yeah. issue. There's clearly some work that still needs to be done around about it. I'm just wondering um, what work is done where a school, for example, may have had a computer science teacher and there's a vacancy, but they decide, well, actually, we're not going to find somebody, or, and that stops being a vacancy. They just stop providing those courses within schools. To what extent are local authorities or schools managing out vacancies by simply re redesigning what their staffing is, because that must then have an impact on recruitment for tra teacher training. And anecdotally, my, my sense is that we lose specialist teachers in primary school and in secondary school, there's a narrowing of the, the range of, of staff that a school might have. Is that captured anywhere? Is that an issue that your, your group has been looking at? It's not captured anywhere. There are I'm sure there will be examples in secondary schools, maybe Jim might want to answer this, where a head teacher has to plan in, in the knowledge that there are certain subjects that they may not be able to get a teacher for. Uh, if, if a teacher leaves, for example, uh, there, will be, there will be some examples of that. I, I don't think there's any data on it. Do you have a in, you know, if there, maybe I'm imagining this, but a school may not offer well, we know that certain schools will not offer certain advanced hires and so on, but presumably there are core subjects that all secondary schools have to offer. Yes. I wonder whether you have a role in ensuring that um, diversity of specialist teachers in primary and secondary school is helped by, by your actual workforce planning, because otherwise it's feeding off itself. You can't get somebody, so you stop running that course, yeah. you don't look for that teacher, so we don't train up teachers yeah. in those subjects. I'll take, I'll take it. There are two parts to the, to the, to the answer. But the first being, and it's coming back to the Smith's point, that uh, vacancies and what vacancies are, and whenever the survey is conducted, will change from day to day. And a vacancy today might be filled tomorrow, a further vacancy might arise tomorrow for cir circumstances which perhaps you knew about or out with our control. And there's an issue there in that you know we got useful information through the survey which was conducted, but that survey is only as accurate as it can be on the day in which it is conducted. So that kind of fits into that part of the, the discussion as well. Again, to answer the question, will schools remove subjects from the curriculum because there is not a teacher available? Kind of yes and no again, and it's not entirely down to the whole notion of having a teacher available. There will be other reasons for that. But sitting within that and sitting in within the complex pattern, to answer the, the particular question you ask, there may well have been, and I think it would be safe to say there will have been schools where we the, yes, the curriculum has been adjusted or will come to an arrangement with the school which is down the road to share the teaching of a subject on account of not being able to get a teacher at the particular point in time where the curriculum needs to be delivered. And that's particularly pertinent where teacher kind of disappears or moves out of the school for whatever reason during sometime during the term when you are part way through a course. And there are ways in which you've got to start to engage with, as I say, school down the road to make sure a local university, for example, to make sure that aspect of the course gets delivered. Okay, move on. Right. Thanks very much for that. Uh, Liz, you've got a question? Uh, yes, I have. Um, it's not unrelated to this, actually, because um, uh, last week, when um, we heard from Lawrence Findlay from uh, Murray Council, um, we had a, an interesting discussion about whether uh, councils should be more active in looking for local people who might become teachers, uh, rather than hoping that people who would like to become teachers go through the uh, usual process. I, I would be very interested to know your views on this. And the related point is whether, in terms of the formula that we're using to workforce plan, do you think that that's the correct one, or do we have to make more adjustments to it? Okay. On. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think it, it does relate to the first question very much. The the point that Mr Dornan made about uh, local information and I think that the, um, the points that Lawrence made last week about um, 
making sure that the training places are where the gaps are is very important. And I'm not sure that's something that's been totally cracked yet. It is something that, um, as an advisory group, we have pushed for a, a sort of reallocation of places. Um, but that is not something that can be done in one fell swoop. It needs to be done gradually just for um, um, universities to respond um, and, and have enough people there to train the teachers. Does anybody else need Mark? Yeah. Um, in terms of the, um, the current methodology, um, the model, um, I think if we look at the information that we have in terms of where it's working and where it's not working, uh, two particular challenges are in the rural um, aspect, uh, outside of the main urban centres, and secondly, in relation to some specific subject areas. Um, I think some of the things that um, we've been doing over the past couple of years where, for example, John was touching on, we've been engaging more with local authority intelligence, uh, both in relation to, as I say, specific subject areas and, and your rural pressures, is the way to go. But I would caution uh, care to say that the way you take that into account is through an arithmetic modelling you know, type approach. A lot of the issues we're seeing are down to very specific circumstances. And some of the initiatives we've begun to undertake are addressing these things rather than trying to come up with a perfect model that's going to land you on exactly the right number of teachers in five years' time, say. Which is an interesting point. Um, are you suggesting that we're too tied to uh, a fairly rigorous arithmetical model and that we should open that up a little bit more? Mm -hmm. yeah, the, the point is well made, and I think it'd be careful, you know, we've got to be careful to look at the, the journey we have moved with the model. The model is much more sophisticated than it was. It's much more, you know, to call it an arithmetical model, yes it is because that's what models are, but it's informed by research, it's becoming increasingly more informed by research at a local level. There is still a bit of that journey to go in relation to better information on the back of more expansive research. And if we're going to start to look, for example, at, as we did in the past, kind of age profile of teachers, which was a fairly blunt way of looking at it, because the landscape changed and the pension arrangements changed, for example, then you start to look at a different way of identifying where the gaps might arise in four to five years' time. And a more sophisticated modelling landscape it might well better inform that kind of long-term view of what we bring it into, or the number of people we bring into the profession, and perhaps starting to inform in advance areas of which there might be a shortage later on. So if the kind of longer-term view of a sophisticated planning model enables you to get more detailed information, to an extent you start to address the local and geographical issues. But there needs to be something underlying that as well, which is going to identify the specific challenges which, for example, exist within northeast rural Scotland in relation to teacher numbers per se and particular curricular areas in, 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 in the demand model. Okay, thank you. Uh, Daniel? Um, yes, yeah, so my line of questioning, I think, follows on from this. I, I, I mean, fundamentally, this is a, a supply and demand issue that you're, you're tackling. It's you know, supply of uh, pro teaching professionals compared to the, the, the need for them in, in the schools. Can I ask, are, are those two elements modelled separately? Because um, I'm just slightly concerned that you're talking about vacancies, and actually vacancies is the, the delta between those two. What you have is a national planning model. So it looks at the data at a national level in terms of the number of teachers we already have, mm -hmm. the number of people who are qualifying to become teachers, and the gap that will be that is projected to exist in any particular year. And added to that are all the refinements in terms of lever rates, returners, uh, all, all the issues that affect the population of either the, the, the students qualifying or the teachers in the system in a particular year. And then there's an attempt to come up with a number that's either a surplus or a deficit. In recent years, it's been a deficit. And that number informs the intake for the universities. However, in terms of what's actually happening on the ground, it's local authorities that manage uh, and determine the staffing levels in school, and they do it by different methods. So you've got different 
a staffing formula okay. in different authorities. So that, that's, that's what makes it complicated. Sure. You've got a national approach, but you've got local staffing and local different ways of, of staffing schools locally. Okay, so, so in your answer there, I mean, I, I think you outlined um, the, the, the modelling of the supply of, of teachers. Um, and, and I think you hinted there that the demand is down to local authorities. I mean, what, what attempt is there or what methodology do you have for, for modelling that demand? Well, you, you look back in previous years, basically, and you're able to, you're able to see what uh, happens to the, to, the, to the profession in terms of the, the stay-on rate or the, the retention rate within the authorities or the lever rate or the returner rate. Uh, you can look at the age profile. So you're, you're modelling uh, the future based on uh, usually looking at a three-year or a five-year rolling average from the past. So, you, so you're, it's a bit like stocks and shares. You, you're trying to predict, sure. predict the future based on uh, the behaviour in the past. But, but, no, but no statistical model can account for the behaviour of individuals or the behaviour of the employers. I, to I, I totally understand, certainly the, the individual point, but, but what you can do is talk to local authorities and yes. find out what their forward plans are. I yes. mean, is there, is, to what extent do you get that information from local authorities about not what has happened in the past three years, but what they're planning to do well, in that, the future that, three that's years? That's what the partners provide, COSLA and ADES, and that is, as I said at the start, that's kind of local intelligence. And one okay. of the issues would be how you take that local intelligence and make it uh, more robust. But it would be difficult for any authority to predict in three years' time how many teachers they would actually require. They, 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 they would, yeah. so Why? That's a challenge in looking at it as a supply and a demand and supply system because the, the universities in providing teacher education programmes um, wouldn't normally plan on a, a, an annual basis, which is the way... The, the committee responds using particularly the one year PGDE qualification to, to raise and lower the number of teachers to be to enter the workforce at the end of the year. So the, the university planning cycle doesn't actually align easily with the, the local authority planning cycles, which is one of the challenges that the new, the new advisory working group will need to tackle. But that's, that's you confusing supply with, with demand. And I, I totally accept that modelling supply is difficult because it's about individual choices. You don't quite know whether people will leave the profession or not, and there's various things. But, but I would have thought demand is really based on two things. One is the number of children you want to teach, and then the other thing is how you want to teach them, i.e. what subjects and the class sizes. That, that should be relatively predictable because we know how many children we're wanting to teach in advance because there's a five-year lead time for them reaching primary school. So is that not a, a more straightforward thing to model? But you still have the same variables of... Uh, when, teachers, when a teacher wants to retire, for example, very often they don't tell the authority till the two months before they retire. Yeah, so but that's, that's the so supply they, side. I'm talking about the demand side. But, but, that, that, but that is a demand. The, 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 you know, if that teacher leaves, then the authority has a demand for, for a teacher. It, it's difficult to predict that precisely. Also, some, the, there are at least a couple of authorities that have a, a threshold model of staffing. Right? Uh, so, you, so not to 15 would be so many teachers, and 15 to 20 would be so many other teachers. Now, one pupil either side of that threshold is one teacher, more or less. And if you multiply that across... You know, big numbers. You only need to get the teachers wrong by one or two, and you've got a difficulty. So, yeah, you could ask authorities to do that, and, and they could they could do it. Uh, whether it would be more accurate than doing it at a national level, I think would be the would be the question. And it, it, yeah, it's, it would it could be done. So, so local authorities right. aren't modelling their, their their future demand in that way. It's separate from they're the not, supply. They're not, they're not asked to do it as part of the teacher workforce planning group. That's do you think they should be? That, that might be one of the issues. I think that's for the group to consider. That's one of the things that might formalise the local intelligence and bring it more into the, the, the mainstream of the model. OK, okay thank you. Uh, before I move on to the, the next questions, myself and uh, my colleague Ruth Maguire met with a, a number of teachers uh, last week. And Ruth's going to ask uh, uh, 
some questions from, we had agreed to ask the questions that they were asking us, but one of the questions which seems pertinent given this, this discussion here was, asked by one of the teachers and supported by many others, and the question was, why are schools still run by education authorities? Would anybody like to take that one on? I don't want to be flippant, but maybe that's a political question rather than a question for... Well, you, know, we, you must have an opinion if it's a good thing or if you think it's the best way to deal with it or I, whatever, I, I, so I, I mean... Certainly, from Ade's point of view, we wouldn't have an opinion on the, the, you know, the politics of it. What about John uh, Stoddard's view? Uh, I'm not here as John Stoddard, unfortunately. <laughs> um, I'm here as, to, to represent Ade's. But our view in any, in any look at the governance structure would be to ensure that all of the functions that are required to be carried out uh, at whatever appropriate level are carried out. And in, in 1996, local government reorganisation, that was the view we took. Uh, our job was to ensure that you know, whatever the politics were, the structures were, that all of the functions that protect children, that ensure quality education, that all of those are, are, are ticked in terms of a, you know, a functional analysis of the way the system works. OK, does anybody else? Yes, Cathy. Was it a surprise to you, that, to Kevinina, that uh, we would believe that schools um, should remain part of education sort of to control? For the simple reason that um, there are so many other complex areas within schools um, and, and the pupils that, that they um, work with that require other services to be part of that uh, engagement. Social care, for example, um, housing, uh, economic growth, I suppose, as well, because that, you know, that can govern um, how a, a community changes and, and what educational requirements are, are required as a result of that. So, from that perspective, and I agree with um, John, yes, it's a political question, and that's the view that we would hold. Okay, can I just remind the, the panel and everybody else that I'm asking a question that was asked of me to ask? Right. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, Ross Greer. Thanks. Uh, convener, just looking at the subject specific issues we have with recruitment, I was wondering if you had any thoughts on what targeted efforts could be made in the professional sectors from which you can draw the people with those skills. So uh, most typically it's STEM subjects that we discuss in this regard. Um, I certainly have personal experience of the techie department at my old school being at one point significantly staffed by engineers who'd essentially taken early retirement and done that for the last decade of their career. Is there more work that can be done on this targeted approach to recruitment in the subjects that have acute shortages? Maybe a fair it's been referred to earlier, the kind of grow your own approach that uh, Murray talked about started in, actually in Aberdeenshire with, uh, uh, Edinburgh, uh, with Aberdeen University. And I know the University of the Highlands and Islands are, are looking at that much more local approach. So you know, we've got people who live and work in the areas. Can we kind of reconvert them into teachers? And indeed, you'll know that's been done recently uh, with limited success in the oil industry for Aberdeen. Uh, so uh, I think a, a lot more needs to be done and can be done to try and look at the resources we already have. There's always a temptation to look at resources that you don't, that you don't have, uh, in, in my experience, and it is quite important to see if we can convert either existing teachers or existing staff, employees. And, uh, there are many um, employees and councils who work with children uh, already. Could, could, if they have a degree, could they, could they convert to teaching? Uh, the, there's also a wider job about a recruitment uh, programme. I know the Scottish Government have already uh, embarked on a, a recruitment programme for teachers. Uh, somehow, I think the big issue is we need to make the job more attractive in, in every way for, for teachers if we're really going to tackle the issues, because the shortfalls are, are significant in areas like technology, uh, Areas like home economics, computing, uh, uh, religious moral education, PE is, is, is struggling. So, yeah, we, we do need to really focus on those shortage areas. And if you're talking about modelling, trying to model how many teachers you need in those subjects for individual subjects is, is I'd say, almost impossible to do. Uh, and and the, the issue that uh, Joanne Lamond raised is an issue. You, you do get a circular thing, you can't get the teachers, therefore you don't offer the subject, therefore it becomes less popular. And some of these subjects like PE and home economics and technology, it's important that that doesn't happen, that we do continue to, to, to run them. And I would reinforce the point that, the, that Jim made, that uh, 
A number of schools are operating within authorities in consortium with each other, so there will be a strategic view of, of timetable in secondary subjects, and if there is a, a real difficulty, there will be efforts made to try and fill that gap in, in whatever way is possible. Uh, to, to, to John's point and the, the whole notion of kind of long term planning, I think that Russ, what you're picking on there is the, the, the issue which is the current and topical issue yeah. related to supp teacher supply at the moment. That over time has varied and that over time has changed given the shift of the economy for no other reason. But you know, you, you pick on an issue which is a real life <coughs> issue for schools and for us as a group. Two aspects to it, and I think might well hear from General Teaching Council in your next session of the kind of specific and targeted approaches that are being taken at the moment to obviate the things which you have identified for us. But there is obviously a need in the longer term for the profession within the profession. If we're going to influence people to see that teaching is a worthwhile profession to pursue, we're perhaps in the best position ourselves as teachers to be able to do that. And we are critically aware of the important task within developing the young workforce, for example, to say you know, teaching is a realistic, worthwhile option to look at in relation to your future career. So there's kind of a long-termism part of it and a short-term part of it to start to look at what are the specific things just now, but with a view within the model which we're trying to pr promote and develop to ensure that the supply part of this actually looks at the demand part in a much more positive way. The, um, the pathway is very important for uh, attracting uh, people into the profession and to ease that pathway so you can move from industry um, or from a second career to um, a third career in, in teaching at different points in your career pathway um, as an individual at any age. And certainly some of the creative work that General Teaching Council has, has been looking at in terms of easing the arrangements for that, I think you'll be able to discuss later, but also the ways that the um, universities have, have responded with the new um, pathway routes into the profession, I think should help in the longer term. Universities have had quite, quite a lot of success in recruiting. There's been um, to these new programmes um, although the oil industry one in Aberdeen wasn't quite as successful as we thought it would be to start with. And there's also a lot of, um, there's a lot of local work going on, particularly in my own institution, the University of the Highlands and <coughs> Islands. We're working directly with local authorities and recruiting locally. And um, our experience from that would be that there is, there is a need to, within the national system, to look at the local information and local need but for that to be to be recognised within the way the national planning is done. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Yeah, um, just a, a, a small point here about creating incentives for people to come into teaching later on. I mean, I, I don't know if there are figures for the models of, you know, back in the day when you start teaching when you were 22 and if you were lucky you get early retirement at 55 or whatever. I presume as in all working lives now, people are, you know, they're doing different things, but what are the incentives that you can build into teaching to people to take the risk to come out of another job and go into teaching at a later stage? And one suggestion, for example, where there's a shortage in STEM, we should have pay incentives. I mean, is there a view on pay incentives for so differentiation by subject um, for teachers? And secondly, have you looked at the possibility of, if somebody has a lot of experience in industry, they don't come in at the same level as somebody who's just graduated, but you can actually bring them in at a higher point in terms of the pay scale? Is that something, A, that you're looking at, and B, is something that the profession and yourselves would contemplate? Okay. I think those are decisions for local authorities themselves to make and in terms of incentives. There are some uh, offering what are, I suppose are called golden hellos to people um, and you know, effectively uh, holding people to um, remain for a minimum number of years in the teaching profession. Um, but it, uh, you know, that has to be um, looked at in the context of there is an agreed pay and conditions package for teachers. If there are incentives, then they are offered at a local level based on the, the ability of the councils to support that. Obviously, if there is a, a need um, or a pressure in relation to particular subjects such as STEM, then you know that will be uh, a focus. 
but there are some examples already in existence of that activity taking place. Some of it is not about direct pay incentives, but it would be perhaps support for other, something like housing, for example, um, so that the, they're not um, not direct pay, but in kind, I suppose, um, support. I wouldn't, or is not having conversations specifically saying, actually, we need to have a differentiated pay scale. We need to have a means by which somebody will give up a well-paid job um, in industry to come into teaching and not be expected to be on a salary scale of somebody who's just come out of university at 22. And are we looking at that both in terms of drawing on that experience and you know the stages in people's career and specifically on um, recognising if we don't, we're not in, I don't think local authorities should be competing with each other, but if you're competing with sectors which are going to pay relatively well, how do we get, if it matters, are we willing to pay the extra money to get STEM subject okay. teachers into our schools? Okay. Um, there is already a, a bit in the terms and conditions that allows um, teachers to be paid higher up the scale based on previous experience, So, I, I, but I don't know how much that's used. From some, some of the examples I've seen, there are um, yes, the, the recognition is about the um, the quality of the the learning um, and the, the CPD that the individual has undertaken uh, in order to uh, demonstrate that they they, they are uh, meeting the standard that's required. Um, councils individually um, will look at uh, that in the context of each person who's applying for for a post. Um, Greg's correct that there is provision within that uh, in the scale. But it does sometimes cause confusion about, um, you know, where people can start and where they're, what they think they're entitled to. Um, however, there are there are methods within the, the, the current system that to allow that. So it uh, appears that the, the, the it's possible we do it, but it doesn't get done. Is that a kind of like broad answer? No, I don't think we're saying it no. doesn't get done. Uh, I think we we don't know to what extent it is used. And that has come up before on other issues, but it is, there is some discretion within it. I suppose if the EIS were here, they'd say, well, there's an obvious answer to attract people from a higher salary into teaching. I know, I know uh, but the, it's limited to what, to what extent uh, authorities can work within the, the, the scheme to make it attractive to people coming from the tech industries and the science industries. Uh, and in addition to that, as Cathy says, a number of authorities have tried generally to put incentives to get teachers in. But I think the bottom line is they're finding there aren't enough people uh, applying for the, the jobs that they have. I think that's that's the bottom line. So I think I think we could maximise all the discretion and power that we have, and I think we would still have a, a shortfall. But I'm expecting that to actually get better over the next few years, given the work that the teaching workforce planning advisory group uh, has actually done because don't forget there's there's a in most most of the degrees there's a four year lag between turning on the tap and the water actually coming out the other end okay uh, Gillian, you wanted to come in briefly small supplementary to the, the, the discussion that's been had because uh, remuneration isn't the only incentive for people. There's more and more there's a lot of people wanting to work part time or have any kind of flexibility around their working life that might attract people who maybe don't want to apply for full time posts. I think traditionally I, I get the impression that people who wanted that flexibility used to go into supply, but they're not doing that so much. Is there anything that really could be done there where in terms of recruitment that it's advertised that you could have some kind of flexibility around your working, but stability at the same time in terms of a contract? Mm. Um, there's the, there are vast numbers of primary teachers on job share contracts or um, um, part week uh, contracts. It's, it's not uncommon at all. It's very, very common. And it's actually one of the complexities for workforce planning is to, to get a handle on the impact of that. Because if you've, got, if you've planned on the basis that a set proportion of teachers are going to come out the other end um, of the training and they're going to fill full-time posts, yeah. but quite a number of them um, end up on job share or part-time posts for whatever reason, they, um, their personal reasons that dictate they want to do that, then all of a sudden your numbers can be quite a way out, yeah, especially if there's a, chain, a transition in behaviours over time. I think that's a really important point, and it is, it is a growing feature of the workforce, and it does actually add to the complexities. I know in some authorities 
they're quite worried about the, 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 the numbers uh, significantly increasing and therefore the difficulties that that means in the school for actually managing maybe twice the number of, of personnel <coughs> than, than they would previously have had to do. But it, it's certainly in the figures, the national figures, you can see it increasing. And the reports locally are that it's becoming more and more popular. The, the workforce is changing and the, the, and the nature of mobility uh, in the workforce is changing. There's just, there's just less capacity for people to move these days. Uh, they're much less willing to move. And you heard some of that from the students themselves in terms of wh where they expected the jobs to be or the other placement to be. So it is, it is a changing uh, demographic. Could I just ask some information about some of the graduates coming out of particularly the PGDE programmes? A lot of the people coming into the PGD programmes are would actually be defined as career changers. The average age of entry to PGD programmes is now 25. Most um, entrants to these one-year programmes have considerable work experience in a variety of areas. So in relation to the discussion um, about a variety of conditions when going into work, um, the, ma the majority of PGDE graduates would already have other work experience and would perhaps expect to be also considered within any any measures that were introduced. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that, Liz. You've got a, just one, a very just, quick just, supplementary just, then. Claire just one clarification on related to what uh, uh, Dr. Redford's just said. Do we have reliable statistics about the number of teachers who are coming in from different routes? Uh, in, including those who may come from industry or with bursary support from elsewhere. Do we actually have reliable numbers about that? I think that, that information would come from, you, you, you would have to ask the universities for that, but universities collect that within the HESA statistics, so it's collected on an annual basis. Okay, okay thank you very much. Claire, you wanted to talk more about flexibility. Uh, yes, thank you, convener. Um, and I do want to pick up on the point Gillian Martin was making there about flexibility. I think uh, you said uh, earlier in the session, uh, John Stoddard, that um, we need to make uh, teaching more attractive. Um, and Ken Muir, um, in, in response to looking at flexible training, um, had been saying that it's crucial in attracting new people into teaching. However, some of the evidence the committee has heard runs very counter to that. Although you were talking about flexible contracts, job sharing and so on. Um, we've heard evidence about lack of flexible working opportunities, uh, lack of job share opportunities and comments that teaching is, is less flexible than other professions. And I was keen to hear what the, the panel's comments were on, on those issues. Um, as, I, as I said earlier, um, certainly from, from my membership, head teachers and uh, deputies and principal teachers in primaries, nurseries and special schools, particularly in the primary sector, there are vast numbers of job shares um, and part-time contracts in the teaching staff, um, much less so for head teachers. And I'm not sure if that was the evidence that you heard. There's not, there, there are very few instances where there are head teachers job sharing. Mm -hmm. And is there a reason for that? Um, the, uh, certainly I know um, a fair number of head teachers who have requested um, reduced hours or job sharing and they've been turned down and I can only relate that to the fact that local authorities are struggling to recruit head teachers so they would be struggling to fill the other parts of the job. Does anyone else have a comment on that particularly with, about head teachers? Um, again, Greg and I come from different sectors and have a different kind of perspective on life. But on this occasion, very similar in relation to the way in which the flexibility of the workforce has developed and expanded over the past 15 to 20 years. I can't think of a secondary head teacher who is involved in a job share partnership. But below that level, just about every, at every other level within secondary education, there will be job shares. That's deputies down to through the whole system. Okay, so, so that does run counter to a lot of or to some of the information the committee's had. I'm really keen to explore then what the rationale would be that, particularly with the concern about the number of people applying for head teachers, that we are saying if you are part time, we're not interested in you. 
Big question. Um, there's, there's a lot in there. I think that there is already an issue of um, supply of head teachers. Um, head teachers are um, visible to the rest of the school community. They are your recruitment pool for your next group of head teachers. They're seeing people working um, long hours. They're seeing budgets being reduced. They're seeing staffing in terms of management time or management posts being reduced. Um, so the job at the moment is probably becoming less appealing. Um, so it would be difficult for a local authority to say yes to a job share because they're not going to be able to fill the gaps. So I can see it from both sides of that. Can, can, I, can I just add, uh, Ades did a report for government on recruitment and selection of head teachers, and I think you included the reference to that report in, in your papers. Uh, and we interviewed a lot of deputies and a lot of head teachers. Uh, we didn't come across any evidence that people weren't applying because it wasn't flexible. It was more the kind of reasons that, that Greg's talked about in terms of the demands on the job, the accountabilities of, of the job to, to children, to parents, to the authority, to government. Uh, sometimes the stress of not having enough cover to allow them the management time to, to do the job. It was really the stresses and strains of, of the of the job and sometimes a lack of support to actually carry out that job. They found it quite, some of them found it quite a lonely uh, job in terms of support, uh, in terms of both, you know, the, the mentorship and, and that side of things, but also uh, budgets uh, and staff, you know, support staff and so on around the school. So they, they saw the job as, as more difficult and demanding. And some of the deputies thought, uh, that they had, you know, they had reached deputy head teacher. There wasn't a huge incentive to become head teacher, and when they saw the demands of the job, uh, and uh, personally, I think it's particularly in, in women's case to look at it and think, well, that's that's a step too far in terms of all the, all the demands and stresses, and, and why would I put myself and my family up for that that stress? Uh, I have to say, I find that quite an extraordinary statement, Mr. Stoddard, to single out females as, as, no, I just, as I, I think, uh, I think looking I, at jobs in a particular uh, way. Well, what, what I meant to say was that sometimes men just see it as a competition, and they go in for the and, 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 they, and they take it as a challenge. Uh, sometimes women, uh, in my experience of speaking to all these people, took a more kind of life, whole life approach to it, and thought, well, the, the additional stress and anxiety. Uh, is not worth uh, uh, struggling. Sometimes, as a personal view, sometimes men take those decisions without necessarily considering the full implications and see it as a, as a competitive Yeah, that. I think, we'll move, I think we will move on, on from that. Although I'm, I'm keen, I, I am keen to know why the, the door seems to be closed to part-time or job share. That if, if local authorities don't advertise these posts as being flexible, then how do they know there's no demand for deputy head teachers to apply for a part-time or a job share head post? I would say they know that there is demand because people do ask for it. Um, I, I know of many members I've spoken to um, who have been asking their local authority for just that, but um, they haven't been uh, enabled to do that. So it's the local authorities who are closing the door on that option? That's my understanding. Also, would add you'd heard um, the evidence from uh, Isabel um, Marshall, Marshall, um, in your first evidence session, and her description of her reasons for deciding to leave the profession. Um, in the first quarter of this year, we had 17 members who stepped down from headship or left the profession altogether, and it was all in response to workload issues. Looking at the same uh, period, the first quarter um, last year, we only had five members doing that, and. Um, None of them um, were talking about workload as the key driver. There were, there were other issues in those five cases. And that's just from cases that have gone to my area officers who have been supporting people making that decision. Can I ask just very briefly, very briefly. about the, the other end of, of the profession then? Um, because we, we did hear about uh, the probation year being inflexible too. Have you got any thoughts on how that could be made a more, more attractive part-time job share for... Uh, for particularly people who are maybe coming through with a PGD qualification? There, well, there's a 
there's there's an option just now. You really would need to ask the general teaching council. But when when students graduate and go into induction year, they can choose to do induction year and 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 take a a, a one year post with a local authority, um, and through that are supported, or they can choose to qualify to meet the standard for full registration through a flexible route, which entails uh, working a set number of days with within schools. Um, there aren't, there isn't the support system with that because they're not um, connected to the structures that a local authority has to support um, uh, teachers on their induction on an induction year programme. So there, there is an option at the moment. Um, I, I, the universities don't really have any further information about that. The, the students leave us and go out into induction year and we do joint work during induction year with local authorities because that's part of the, the teaching qualification. It's, it's not just about what you do in the university setting, it's about the induction year in local authorities and completing the standard for full registration. Um, I, I suppose it's, a, it's an area nationally we, we could explore in relation to offering other routes to complete the standard for full <coughs> registration. We can ask the next panel the same question, Claire. OK, thank you very much. Uh, Joanne, you want to come in? It's on this question of how difficult are we making it for people to become teachers. We've already said there are people out there who could be good teachers, who've got great experience, but they're not 22 and they're not just come out of university. They're not in a position to do placements wherever, that 90 minute thing. They might not even want to take the risk of losing a salary for a year in order to train. And I wonder what work you've done to look at making the, the, the year of teacher education more flexible. Because I was quite surprised. It feels just like what it was like when I was at Jordan Hill. I mean, genuinely, it feels like it, that you do a bit of, you do, you've got placements and you do stuff in university now rather than college. But the, the, the pressure around you have to make the placement in a particular place, there's not flexibility around your caring responsibilities or you know, what income you have. It feels to me it still presumes that somebody is 22 years of age with family support that will allow them to focus and go out in placements. So I wonder what work has been done, either considering how you factor in people's caring responsibilities or whatever into placements, how do, could you change the, the, the year's education, and are there, excuse me, <clears throat> any means by which you could train as a teacher while mean, keeping your job? That is, you could do it part-time, flexibly, um, yes, remotely? Yes, there, are. There, are, there are two routes currently that you can do that. Um, the University of Aberdeen has run its what's called Delight programme with um, authorities in the north and east, particularly Aberdeen City, Aberdeen Shire, Murray, and Highland, where um, local authority employees are supported to career change and they complete the Aberdeen University programme, I think, over a period of 18 months. Um, and that's a, a structured part-time taught programme. The University of Dundee last year introduced a similar programme in response to local authority requests and ha is working currently with Perth and Kinross and Angus. Um, both those universities are going to expand those programmes to offer, offer them uh, across the country. Um, the University of West of Scotland's run a particular programme with Dumfries and Galloway um, that I, I don't have full information about that programme, but I think has involved staff being released for a year. Uh, my own university works, has worked very closely with Corrin and Yale and Shear over the last um, year um, where the Corgia have supported <coughs> both their own employees and other people living and committed to living on the islands um, to uh, complete a one-year PGDE programme. The authority chose to offer uh, financial support. You heard from one of our, our students earlier um, and the that person, when they successfully complete the PGDE year, um, has agreed to, to work with the authority in induction year and I think for one year beyond. There are a range of, uh, through the new routes into teaching, there are a range of other programmes where we're looking at, at um, condensed telescoped, telescoped programmes that will, will bring um, new teachers into the workforce on a faster route. Um, 
and the universities would, I think, be particularly keen that some of that range, because there were 11 different programmes, I think 13 of you include the new programme you heard about in the University of Edinburgh, the oil-based programme for, um, in Aberdeen, the universities would be very keen that, that we we evaluate these routes and the success of them um, and look to learn from that and then look at what you've referred to as, as a traditional model. The question of placement, which did come up a lot in, in the evidence we got from um, people who were in initial teacher education, that that becomes a burden and a block, not so much actually being in the school with staff was a question about this, you know, this the consistency of mentoring because of the pressure that's on staff, but just simply that thing about not being given lots of notice and not being all that suitable, not factoring in, you know, you're not going to be able to drive or you're got caring response, you've got to get children to school yourself. Mm -hmm. I mean, do you evaluate from your students their concerns about that and does that then get fed into the process of how it doesn't feel like a difficult job to me to have placements that meet the pressures that students are under, and I wonder if that's an issue that's come up to you. Jim wants to answer I'll, that. I'll take that one. In that we, we haven't, certainly last year, been particularly clever, as I perhaps you're, you're hinting at, in the way in which we engage with students and the, the placement experience. We have moved very definitely towards a system now where placements, schools, do not, cannot out cannot opt out of being a school in which there will be a placement. It is assumed now that schools will be opted in. So it takes away that part of the negotiation or checking within the university that said, well, that school doesn't accept people on placement. It is now accepted that schools will take people on placement unless there are pre-identified special sub circumstances. If, for example, principal teacher of the biology department has been absent for a particular period of time, we wouldn't perhaps want to put a student into that. So that should change the emphasis and perhaps introduce into the system the flexibility, the greater flexibility that you're looking for in relation to being able to match a student who cannot drive to a school which is within their local area, as opposed to, you know, let's pick it off the list because those are the only schools which are on the list. There will be many more schools on the list now than ever were before. But you would also categorise by, I mean, if we're actively trying to encourage people who have already got a working life and have got families <laughs> to go into teaching because we recognise there's a shortage, why make it difficult for them by offering the placements that they can't manage giving that they're older and they have family responsibilities. Yeah, I think it factors that, that particular part, that, that can, the individual difficulty experienced by a student, whether it be a 22-year-old or a 41-year-old, enables the university to have a significantly greater degree of flexibility and an ability to match, if not target, the particular demand requirement circumstance of a student into the, the schools which they have available to them. The universities and the local, local authorities have been working closely with the GTCS who, who, who manage the SPS system for us um, this past year and a number of refinements including that key one about more schools being automatically available for placement have been have been made and it's actually quite rare for students to to end up to have to to be asked to travel a considerable distance and I think it's really important that you know that the universities work very closely with students they listen to them they um, they uh, they they, they respond to, to issues that are raised about placement as we do in it, to any other aspect of the programmes that they're following. I think it was significant. It was definitely a theme across the, the, the evidence that we got that that was something they felt that wasn't factored in and it, it created stress, unnecessary stress and what's in a, a stressful time anyway. Um, I wonder just very briefly, if a school has um, has to opt in and has chosen not to, and we're now saying you, 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 you've got to opt out. Mm -hmm. Do we know what factors are taken into account and why people might do that? It would, it, would, it would be specific factors within that school or within, certainly in the secondary sector, within individual departments within that school, okay. but specific and identified. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Ross? 
Just coming back to this issue of um, mobility, particularly in, in the region I represent, the North East, where, as you know, there are chronic um, shortages in um, teachers. Um, we've heard from um, trainee teachers um, that there's a, a tendency to gravitate towards the central belt and you know, take positions um, elsewhere. And we've heard about some of the local incentives. You've mentioned them yourselves. We've had the golden hellos, help with rent, help with housing. Um, but when I asked this um, last week, um, the uh, Lawrence Finlay from Murray Council said that he would actually favour a national scheme with some local flexibility purely because of the risk of local authorities trying to outbid each other. Um, so I was wondering if you could talk to me about what you think some of the risk is around about that competition with local authorities and what sort of national scheme um, could be beneficial? What would that look like? I'd just say something before maybe my colleagues jump in about the, the risks side of it. I think there is a, a, a real need to make sure that people are trained in the right places. You know, there's a, a struck, there, or there has been previously a structural unemployment uh, problem within the teaching workforce and that there have been um, people in the central belt without jobs and they're not willing to travel. Meanwhile, there have not been enough people in the North East or um, Highland or Dumfries and Galloway. And um, the, the situation, I think, has maybe worsened a little bit and then there are issues about supply all over the country at the moment. But, um, but the evidence that you were given, I think, from uh, both panels that you've seen already, was it was very clear the students weren't willing to travel. They, they, they were talking about... Um, you go to somewhere that you're familiar with, and I think that's absolutely right. So that the, the um, local knowledge about the number of uh, the demand for teachers in a particular area should feed into um, how much, how many training places are in each university. Yeah, yeah I, 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 sorry. I think what we will end up with, both in terms of the teacher workforce planning and the individual initiatives, will be a national model supplemented by local partnerships with uh, the, like the North East Consortium with a group of authorities and the university trying to fill particular needs for their particular areas. I think that, that's the way it will, it will pan out. And I think Greg's point is worth reinforcing. Uh, the figures in research tends to suggest that if you trained all the people in the places where there was the, the, there was the demand and if you were able to match that in terms of a geographical structure to it, uh, we would have much less of a of a difficulty. And the other thing I, I think I would like to make the committee aware of is that there are a lot of demands on schools in meeting the, the demands for these places. So a school in the central bit in the central Glasgow could get several requests uh, from one university might cover the, the, the four year course and from other universities all to be in at the same time. So it's it, it is actually quite difficult to meet the demand uh, for places generally, but to meet everybody's individual needs in terms of where they want them is is quite a demanding uh, challenge for universities and for the schools themselves. And certainly when I worked in Aberdeen, I found that they tended to, the, the, the universities tended to gravitate towards the city and the centre of the city as opposed to Aberdeenshire and Murray be, because it was it was more convenient and uh, th there were cost implications about sending students and tutors all the way out to uh, the far flung places of Scotland. So that so there are a number of factors about how we try to structure the system so that we're training the people in the places where they're likely to end up. Because that's that's what the research tends to show that most student teachers end up in the areas that they. Trained in. Mm. Um, I think there's some evidence from within Scotland in terms of some, um, let's call them financial incentives we've, we've tried to we've tried to use that has got the effect of encouraging people who are not originally from a rural area into a rural area. There's certainly evidence from down south around about this that actually it's not effective. That although you might get people to move into an area uh, initially, yeah, they will bluntly take the money for that period but actually the retention if they're not originally from that area can be pretty poor so i think john's right actually you know starting um, you know further back in the process and thinking about people in an area and encouraging them to think about career as a teaching 
um, probably would be the more sustainable approach uh, to take. In other words, it's not just money necessarily, it's also thinking a bit more, in a more sophisticated way about how you tackle some of these issues. Sure, of course. Um, thank you very much um, for that. Um, I would like to pick up um, Dr Redford, just in one of the answers that you gave earlier, you talked about um, the scheme in Aberdeen run about getting those who are made redundant in oil and gas into teaching, which, which I presume is the transition training fund. Is, yes. is that what you, mean? Um, you said that hadn't been um, a success, and you're right, the numbers have been really low in terms of those who are going into the teaching profession in particular. Um, mm -hmm. Why do you think that is, and what do you think could have been done differently, or could be done differently? Um, I don't have detailed information about it, um, but I understand that um, it was perhaps the people who, some of the people who came into the scheme did not have a full understanding of, of what they were about to undertake in schools um, and the experience, the initial experience in schools wasn't what they thought, it, what the career they thought they were going into. Um, so I, I think that's that that they are the main reasons I think why some people began the programme and dropped out. But John might have more no, more information. No, sorry. Okay. No, it's okay. No, thank you very much. Um, I mean, I know across the the north of Scotland, we've seen the number of registered supply teachers um, fall. So in Aberdeen City, there's actually been a thirty percent drop in the number of supply teachers, with many. Uh, older uh, teachers making up the majority of um, supply teachers. What do you think is putting them off? Do you think it is because of changes in the curriculum? Do you think it's to do with the greater workload, which we've spoken about um, already, particularly in relation to, to head teachers? Um, why do you think it is that we're seeing such a fall in supply teachers, particularly when we, we need people in the classrooms, given the level of vacancy? More general point, uh, Mr Thompson, um, which is that over the piece, I think I would argue, uh, through the various bits of work we're doing in the advisory group, we're getting more accurate over time in the national picture in terms of the, uh, total, the total requirement for teaching versus the total number of teachers that are available. Yeah? Some of you may remember that um, several years, almost literally seven or eight years ago, we had an opposite problem, and we've already touched on that, where we had arguably too many teachers and there was a you know, huge concern uh, about uh, jobs there. So, rather perversely, by getting more accurate, yeah, therefore, if you like, round about the edges, and supply teaching is one of these bits that's round about the edges, there is naturally going to be uh, uh, less people uh, available um, uh, for, uh, for, you know, for that part of the market, if we can call it that. In there's other aspects, I think, in relation to supply, which I'm um, not so well qualified to you know, comment on, but there is that general thing. The more precise you get about your predictions, then around about the edges, it will become uh, much tighter. But to say there are other aspects, and other colleagues can come in on that. There's always been you need at least 10% more than your planned workforce in order to have enough to cover you know, the day in February when everybody gets flu. But of course, it's a very tricky act to pull off because you'll then have teachers who are, who are on the supply list who'd much rather be doing uh, more work or more regular work or more guaranteed work or, or full-time work. Hence, a number of authorities have uh, permanent supply pools that re refresh every two years. So I think the lack of supply is, is just a symptom of the fact that there are fewer people available for work as teachers. So it's not so that so that that pool. Uh, went down in the same way that the, the supply of teachers went down and in, in many cases when jobs do come up uh, they're also being uh, in, in part filled from not, not maybe the, the group of staff that you talked about who may have retired and, and are happy to do a day or two, two per week but there's another group who actually are, are looking for full-time employment and traditionally 20 years ago that was, that was the route in for many teachers into full-time employment. <coughs> Many people started that way in order to get their foot in the door, then get some experience and a reputation, and then ha had a full-time job. But that, but you can see that there's a, there's a huge kind of balancing act to be done there. If the if the government get it slightly over, then you'll have lots of complaints as you did eight nine years ago uh, about teachers being unemployed and being trained for unemployment. And you can you can hear the headlines. And remember Michael Russell answering that question on a, on a radio phone-in programme. But if you get it wrong the other way and authorities can't staff their schools, then uh, 
they, it, it makes it difficult for them to fulfil their statutory obligations to provide education. So it's it's a very fine balancing act, and it is it is it, I find it amazing how how you know how close uh, the government manages to get the to get the figures. But it's it's a, it's a tricky one. Jim yeah. uh, wants to come. <laughs> there are two points, and John, John has uh, just picked up on one of them. It's related to the, the, what the, the kind of makeup of what the supply pool was maybe 10 to 15 years ago. And John has quite uh, well described the whole notion of young people coming from initial teacher education, finding themselves without a job, finding themselves on the supply pool, fulfilling a function within the supply pool for schools but also gaining from that the, exper the experience which perhaps would lead them into a job. Uh, move the system on a wee bit to, where, uh, to a point in time where there were growing teacher shortages. These people were then gradually incorporated and assimilated into the system. The other part of the supply pool makeup was folk who had retired and who still felt they had something to offer to the profession and over that period of time did that through coming onto the supply pool and supporting schools in that way. Again, run it forward from 10 to 15 years ago, the demography is such now that you know, these people no longer feel that they are able to do that. And in a period where there are teacher shortages, the soak up into the system diminishes the supply pool in terms of people coming in, people who perhaps return to teaching and put themselves onto the supply pool, suddenly become incorporated within to the system. And at that point, the, the, the elder members of the supply pool had decided, you know, life holds other things for me other than going into being a teacher every day. So hence we are, I think, in perhaps the cyclical situation that we are in just now. Um, the question, Kevin, because I know we've already touched on sort of a uh, GTS criteria and the flexibility um, of that. Would you agree that it should be made more flexible to allow more highly skilled individuals who maybe have some experience of teaching, um, whether that's been abroad, whether that's been in languages, whether that's been through youth work, um, to come into teaching? Um, and therefore, do you believe that a teach first style system would be one option of doing so? Universities don't. Um believe that the Teach First structure um, offers the same depth of learning and, and establishing a professional identity and development of skills um, in its structure that it's used in, in England and Wales where um, Teach First employees are based in schools um, and in recent years have then completed a a postgraduate certificate on a part-time basis while teaching. Um, the, the Council of Deans feel quite strongly that the model that we have developed in Scotland, um, the one-year PGD, particularly the one-year PGD qualification, um, with its half-time in university, establishing um, the learning and professional reflective skills that you need to be able to respond to different teaching situations um, combined with half of the time in schools working with experienced practitioners is a stronger way to develop the workforce. It also is a way to bring people into the workforce and retain them in the teaching workforce. The statistics of people retained <coughs> after completing Teach First um, programmes of work are, 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 are much, much lower um, and the Teach First programme itself is uh, premised, I mean it's original development from, from, from Teach America and other programmes in other countries, is about the, the development of, of management and entrepreneurial skills and the focus in, in certainly the programme established in England and the programme that has been stopped in Wales was very much about providing some community experience and then uh, people leaving the teaching workforce. The universities believe our, our national challenge at the moment is to bring people into the workforce and retain them there. And in particular, in relation to Teach First, there was an advert in The Guardian last week from PricewaterhouseCooper looking for people, graduates who had completed two years with Teach First and they could then go on to a career in business. 
Council of Dean is very focused on working with our partners across education in Scotland to bring people into teaching as a career for a longer term. Very briefly. Morag has touched on uh, a piece of evidence around about uh, Teach First. Um, I'm conscious just looking at the committee's deliberations uh, and so on. I don't think there's been much yet looking at other countries, other jurisdictions. Um, quite an interesting little booklet of, um, a colleague passed to me uh, the other day is a research study by the Higher Education uh, Policy Institute that's been, that looks at the past 20 or so years of development of um, teacher education and training in England. Um, and uh, while well, some of the developments in England um, I don't think sit very well with Scottish approach uh, to things. There's a lot in here I think that is helpful just to reflect on, if nothing else, to avoid doing the wrong thing. Yeah? And Teach First is covered in here partly. I can send a link to this booklet if that would be helpful to the committee. You and there's certainly have, evidence you, in there which is helpful. You don't have a booklet about education in uh, Barbados or anything like that? <laughs> I'll see if I can find something. <laughs> Uh, okay, Gillian. Yeah, I'd like to look at the retention issue. Um, a lot of the te teachers we've had in here, maybe the one that's been mentioned who was leaving, a lot of the, the issues around it has been about bureaucracy, workload. And uh, I have noticed in, in, in conversations with a lot of uh, teachers that even though there might be moves from, from, for example, Education Scotland to get rid of bureaucracy, or have a less onerous inspections uh, regime, um, that doesn't seem to be filtering down to teacher level. And I would like to ask you what you, you think are, is, a, is a log jam there. Is it too much of an expectation on head teachers on their teachers, maybe to carry out practices in a certain way? Or is it uh, directors of education perhaps having uh, expectations on, on, on their teaching cohort? Perhaps start from, yeah. from the Education Scotland perspective. Um, you're right in that teacher shortages did feature in the um, workload review that, that we carried out, although actually the prime emphasis of that was on curriculum planning, <coughs> assessment and reporting. Of course, teachers and local authorities and head teachers took the opportunity, opportunity to raise um, teacher shortages and expectations on head teachers, as we've heard, for, for other, other duties, um, all of which leads to less time for leadership or for um, preparing for learning and teaching. Since we wrote that report, um, Deputy First Minister has written to all local authorities to stress the importance of taking action. And we've followed that through with our area lead officers, and we've been collecting good practice now that's on the website as ways of actually trying to tackle um, some of the issues that get in the road for teaching ev every day and to give you some examples of that tracking and monitoring which is where young people are preparing reports it, for parents can take a lot of time um, and we have some good examples of that now from different local authorities who are sharing that and we have that on our national improvement hub so i'm beginning to see the local authorities responding taking a report very seriously and beginning to, beginning to collect good practice now, agreed by all the partners in the local authority, including the professional associations, that this is actually reducing workload. So we're seeing some moves filtering down now to the, the teacher level. As we heard from a couple of people <coughs> that have been in front of us that, um, for example, going back to inspections, that although inspections are less about the kind of like going around with a clipboard, as they, as they were, and more about encouraging good practice and about um, working with, with, with schools to, to improve rather than just a judgment uh, situation. That in a lot of schools, people are still finding them very stressful in terms of the preparation and lead up to inspections because there's expectations been put on them by the local authority or by the people running the school. Um. Can I one final point to say, you know, if you're relating um, certainly head teacher retention to inspection, it tends to be more of an issue following an inspection rather than in front of an inspection, but that's another matter. Um, um, 
prefer not to. Okay. <laughs> um, it was a, more, more of a flippant comment, let's say. But uh, inspection and the inspection regime, I think, as you, hint, you have hinted at, has changed and changed quite remarkably over the course of the, <coughs> the past five years. It would not be... It would not be the process now, it is not the process now, that it was certainly in the first inspection as a head teacher that I went through, and that was maybe 15 years ago. The exercise is very much an exercise in sharing, as an exercise in understanding. Yes, there will be challenges made to the school, but there will also be support made to the school, and the regime is much, much more flexible and much more responsible, responsive now than it ever was. To tie in the inspection process to teacher retention, I would be struggling to find a link in there. There's just one example of, of workload, you know, so I suppose I was using that as an example of one of the areas where you're trying to get rid of the unnecessary, unnecessary workload at a top level, but it's not filtering down. That was one example that was highlighted. Um, I, I would have the same concerns as Jim about making that link in the sense that it's a sample model. so. Inspectors are only coming through the door of a primary school about 11, 12 years, uh, every 11 or 12 years. So it's not an ongoing big issue for schools. However, the lead up to inspection is a stressful experience, as you would expect, and it, it does create a lot of um, additional workload as schools try to present themselves in the best possible light at all levels. Um, and um, the inspectorate have been doing tryouts of short notice inspections, so two days notice. And that's something that, as an association, we, we very much welcome. That's something we've had in feedback from members for a long time and have been um, presenting to Education Scotland as, as a potential um, direction to take. Um, and and um, there were tryouts, there were some difficulties around about those tryouts that the inspectorate are trying to overcome. And hopefully, we're going to be seeing more of the short notice inspections um, in the not too distant future because that's something we would welcome. So particularly in a primary, I know that there are different issues, perhaps in um, very large establishments or, or some secondaries. Um, but in terms of workload issues, um, what our members tell us, the top seven um, workload issues for them are reduction, removal of class cover. So head teachers are spending in primary schools a vast amount of time covering class because there's a shortage of teachers. The second is that they would like more management time or protected management time or a greater management team because in a number of authorities they've seen the number of hours of management time reduced or the number of personnel in a management team reduced. And I think you had some information previously about the number of joint headships that were um, cropping up around the country. And is that that's a decision made by the local authority in terms yes. of that structure? Yes, and it's different in each authority. Um, and in, it's not until you get to... Dempster, could you just uh, uh, do it briefly, please? Yeah, it's not until you get to third place that it's um, reduction in, in bureaucracy that comes through, which point I was going to make. And then after that, it's proper support for additional support needs pupils. OK. okay. Right, thank you, Gillian. Colin? Thank, thank you, Convener. Um, I'd also like to look at some of the issues around retention of teachers, because obviously that, that very much affects the, the workforce planning um, Jane Martin's already mentioned about uh, workload and uh, obviously teachers see the environment they work in as being overly bureaucratic. Um, but there's other issues as well, uh, including, for example, around salaries, especially in the early years. Do you, do you have any evidence that salaries are causing a difficulty with retention of teachers, particularly in those early years? point of view, we, we don't have that evidence. Uh, I've looked at a couple of authorities just in preparation for the meeting today, and there, there doesn't appear to be a problem with retention rates. And when you look at uh, authorities that have a less retention rate, and you look into the reasons why people leave, often it's to get a job nearer to where they where they uh, where they live. So, that, so that the main reasons for people leaving would be retiral uh, or to get another job elsewhere. 
uh, would, uh, and all authorities would have some kind of system for exit interviews and so on. So, can I, can I just clarify what you, what you said there? Yeah. You said there's not a problem with retention. No, rates. I, say, I, I say I don't have info. Adis doesn't have information that there is uh -huh. that there is a problem. That's not to say that, 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 that there isn't one or. I mean, we must have some statistics, some figures that back it up. The fact that there is a retention issue. Yeah. Give you a wee bit of help there, I think. Um, uh, we organise uh, across um, all of uh, the university sector um, uh, a couple of surveys that look at retention of uh, graduates or graduate destinations, I should say. And um, in relation to uh, teacher education, uh, within six months of graduating, um, it's around about 98% of um, uh, people who have been students yeah, are in the teaching uh, profession. We also do one that's um, uh, looks a bit further out, about three and a half years after graduation. There are significant problems the further you get out trying to um, you know, contact the pool of people who have been you know, through an education programme, whatever area it is. So that's around about three and a half years out. With the caveat I've already given, it's around about the same percentage. It's around about the 97, 98% that are still in teaching. Um, so it looks high, although I do caution the further you get out, the more difficult it is to be sure of the accuracy of the statistics. The fact would be to look at the absence rates, which all authorities do very, very, in very detail and treat it seriously. And it's not, it's actually quite positive for teachers compared to other professions and to other council workers. So you're looking at three, four percent, which is kind of uh, average or slightly below average. That seems to conflict a little bit with some of the evidence that we've been taking. Um, another issue which was brought up, it was about lack of promotion, the change in the structure, flattening of structure, and lack of pro available progression as there used to be through, it, through the years. Is that a valid reason at a certain point in a teacher's career that that impacts on their willingness to carry on? I think it's an issue for the profession. And it was noted in the report that was done on head teacher recruitment. There has been a flattening of the structures, and the differentials, certainly between deputy head and head teacher, do uh, do not encourage or incentivise uh, enough people to go on and take that step. And in fact, in a, in a large school as a deputy, you can be earning more than you are in a head teacher of not much s smaller school. So there are issues about the the structure. Uh, and the and the opportunities for promotion, whether that actually encourages people to actually leave the profession, I don't think there's any evidence for that. And uh, people people saying that they want to leave or that they're unsatisfied with their their jobs and actually resigning, of course, is a, is a huge step between those two things. And in these circumstances, you would have to be very very determined to to, to resign. A, a post in teaching, so there's a number of nuances in there about you know how, how, you know getting to the bottom of how people actually do feel about their 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 job. But I think the evidence shows that people are not as satisfied as, as you would want them to be in in a, a workforce like teaching, where morale is very important. And that's not to say that there aren't uh, very energetic teachers, uh, brilliant teachers everywhere, but generally you you do. You do, you do hear negative views about the the pressure, the stress, and the the difficulty of uh, doing the job without all the resources that that were previously available. So that in the last time you could have conducted a survey to say that teachers were reasonably happy, I think, was not long after the Macron and the teaching profession of the 21st century, uh, and that was in 2001, 2002. It was 2006. It was fully implemented. Uh, but these things, um, I've been in education 40 years, and these things do come in cycles. And they, they, I was looking at it yesterday, they come in 20 year cycles, where you, where you do get you know, some attempt to really structurally address the, the dissatisfaction, and, and it, it, it goes back up to, to good. And then over a period, uh, as pay and conditions and the economy uh, declines, you get more dissatisfaction. Actually, all the teachers we spoke to uh, quoted uh, the complexity of additional support needs yeah. within the classroom as being an issue, because obviously teachers can't be an expert on everything. Yeah. Um, have you had any feedback on that? Is that, is, is, is that 
a reason <coughs> for having retention issues down the line? Yeah. Well, a premise, but I, I don't think there are uh, significant retention issues. The figures don't tell me that. But I, Point. It appears to be two different things. One is we get evidence saying that those teachers are thinking of leaving, blah, blah, blah. But there doesn't seem, from what we're getting yeah. from you, is that they may well say that, but they don't do it. Yes. Yeah. Earlier, yeah. yeah. Um, and just to emphasise, the statistics I was quoting was about recently graduated teachers, yeah. Yeah, so within six months and three and a half years. I think some of the other evidence, information, input the committee has received, of course, is about the teacher workforce throughout the whole of its career. And these are two But again, we don't things. seem to be getting from any of the other witnesses sure. any evidence to suggest that there is a problem with retention. Indeed. Greg, uh, are you going to now prove me wrong? Well, as I said earlier, we've, in the first quarter of this year, we had 17 people demitting their post, and it was uh, um, those are the ones that our area officers had supported. So there, there may be more that I'm not aware of. But they were all quoting workload. It wasn't the pay. It was the workload that was the issue. But that workload um, affects people's decisions about applying for headship. So it's not retention, but it's recruitment into headship where that's an issue. Um, and pay is also an issue there because, as John said, the way that um, the salaries are arrived at for school leaders, if um, you're in a, a larger school as a deputy, why would you take on the role of a head teacher for less money? So, so th there is a problem with financial incentives as well as the workload issue. Jim, do you want yeah, to come yeah, Just to add to, add to that, to kind of develop the discussion a wee bit further. The, um, John picked up the, the notion of TP21 and what it put into to the system in relation to support and financial support and financial remuneration for the profession. There is no doubt that there has been an erosion of teachers' terms, uh, financial conditions over that period of time. And you know, it sits there in the middle of any discussion in relation to retention and attraction of people into the profession. It can be made attractive. It's not something I would suggest it would be a major thing, but it can be made attractive <coughs> in relation to getting people in here by comparison with other professions which they are choosing. Another part related to this is very much uh, related to job sizing toolkit and the fact that it is used to differentiate pay grades within senior leadership within schools in Scotland. It wasn't particularly fit for purpose in the year 2000, and the system has changed significantly since that. And much, which, much of what is expected of senior leaders within Scottish secondary schools is not captured in any way by the job sizing toolkit. And the, the, you know, the, the, the thing that John picked up in relation to differentials and a head teacher, why, why would you become a head teacher if a financial incentive just did not exist for you to do that? If you're a deputy in a large secondary school, would you move? And the issues are related perhaps to you know, geographical issues to a small rural secondary school where by dint of the job sizing toolkit, you weren't going to be financially rewarded and you had to do with all the upheaval of moving yourself from a comfortable place in the central belt of Scotland to a rural environment, which might be very, very attractive to you, but financially, you know, you know, it just it is not worth your while in doing that. So, you know, with the job sizing toolkit, you know, essentially what you're looking at is trying to run a 4G phone on a first generation SIM card. That's where we are with it. Okay. Thank you very much for that. Cathy? Just to make that, uh, to make some clarification about the job size and toolkit. Um, the toolkit was designed um, some years ago, prior to CFE. Um, I think there's, a, there's an acknowledgement by those that use the toolkit and by those who train uh, council staff in using the use of the toolkit that it's not as, it's not foolproof. Um, for the reasons that I've just set out, it hasn't. It doesn't take account of the, the changing um, landscape in terms of CFE, the, in, the increased number of subjects that might be taught. But at the time when it was developed, it cost several million pounds to develop, and I don't think anyone has the budget to change that, because if you change one aspect of it, you have to change everything else within it. Um, so. I think I hear what others have been saying about that, but there is a 
there's a, there would be a financial um, disincentive, I think, at the very least. Um, and unless someone can come up with that, that volume of, of resource to change it, then I think it's unlikely it will change in the, the near future. OK, thank you. Ross, would you want to... Yes, thanks. Um, just on, on the point around retention, is there an issue of a lack of a career progression structure short of management? That very quickly, if you want to progress your career within teaching, you have to move into management because there simply aren't the promoted posts before that point. Yeah, that's probably the case. Uh, the chartered teacher under Macron attempted to resolve that issue, but I think it was unsuccessful in, in doing that. Uh, so, so it is it is a job where you often have to give up the the expertise you have as a teacher in order to take on management responsibility. Uh, and I don't think I don't think there's an easy solution to that. Uh, I know that in the McCormack report there was a kind of hint or suggestion that you could award uh, short-term additional payments in, in, in a way that the structure in, in teaching in England had, what successfully did, where you could get a, an additional responsibility payment for a year, two years, and these could be at different levels in order to develop the curriculum, reward good practice and so on. But uh, that wasn't accepted. It was seen by some as you know, who, who would decide who gets them and would, you know, would it be fair and would it actually reward uh, good practice or how, how would you administer and manage such a, such a rewards system. Uh, so I, I think there are issues there about how you keep the best teachers in the classroom. I, again, personal anecdotes, but I think it is relevant. I do sometimes hear of excellent teachers and their way out is to become a guidance teacher. That's their way into, into management. And I always think uh, it's a real loss because the people I know are, you know, first-class teachers, and then they create a, a, a vacancy in a shortage subject that's very difficult to fill. So there is, there is, there are structural issues. Hey, Joanne. I just can I check? Um, is the chartered teacher system still operating? And do you have a view on why it failed? Because I think that senior teacher kind of role kind of did that. You get a bit of extra responsibility, yeah. but the balance of your time was very much focused in in, in the classroom. I wonder if. Has there been any work done on why it failed? Oh, maybe Jim could answer. I know why I think it failed. But <laughs> <laughs> As do I. And you know, one, one of the... It kind of fell by the wayside because it, did, it ultimately did not fulfil the function that it was intended to do in the first place, which was to recognise good practice and reward good practice and have it promoted within the school and use it within the school. What it eventually became was an exercise to go through to get yourself more pay. There is an opportunity out there within, I would suggest, what Scottish College for Educational Leadership is doing, to start to look at one or two of the kind of things that have been suggested right through here and to you know, move it on perhaps a wee bit from Ross's original question who talked about into management to start to look at into leadership an effective leadership role within schools which could be recognised and acknowledged and financially rewarded within the structure of leadership which is developing within scale and within the scale leadership framework. Can I just come in from univer the universities where we're very much involved in in the charter teacher programme um, and it involved the development of a lot of master's based programmes focused entirely on practice and the universities would feel that that quite strongly that that aspect while we have continued to offer those programmes the the ending and the closure of the charter teacher scheme um, meant that that teaching in Scotland did not reap the full benefits of that going on and coming back fully into practice. Um, and it, it's an area that the, the government have continued to support uh, the development of master's level learning for teachers um, who are then, um, through the work they do within university-based programmes, able then to lead developments and with, within, within school and within their clusters and contribute in a stronger way to curriculum and other developments within school. Um, and that was an aspect that was beginning to come through in the group of graduates who were working in schools with, within the Charter Teacher Programme. 
Okay, thank you. Uh, and finally, Ruth McGuire has a number of questions from the teachers at the moment. Thank you. Convener, as the convener mentioned, we um, had a focus group with teachers um, last week. Um, probably want to put on record um, our thanks to them for their um, frank and open um, discussions that we had with them. It was, it was very valuable. Um, we asked them, the teachers what questions they would ask you. So I'm going to ask you some of them um, just now. Um, and the first ones are for COSLA and ADES. Um, and the question is, what planning do education authorities have for long-term leave, like maternity leave, or an, an, in anticipation of people taking planned retirement? John's already um, made reference to the fact that, that uh, those who wish to retire from teaching um, are only obliged, I think, well, maybe not obliged, but often only provide about two months' worth of, of notice um, in terms of, of their intention to, to retire. So that can create issues, I suppose, in terms of making decisions on, on uh, recruitment and um, workforce planning. Maternity, uh, different prospect, and obviously um, I think those who, who are considering or are, are, are indicating that they, they plan to take maternity leave will offer that information at different times depending on their individual circumstances. I suppose the other factor in that is whether or not they decide to take the full year's leave at the other end or decide to come back earlier. Um, and that's very much a personal decision. So all of those factors um, will have to be born into. Yeah. But undoubtedly, um, communication from the teacher to the school to the education authority um, is key to all of that. And I'm sure there's always better ways that that can be done um, to encourage, you know, clearer workforce planning uh, as a result. I, I suppose you're, you're setting out what happens, but, but what planning do, do local authorities and education departments do? Because you, you do, particularly with, I take on board your point about the two months notice for retirement, but for maternity um, leave, you'll often have a, or I would imagine, a, a longer lead up to that. It's tend to work very closely with head teachers in the staffing. Staffing is a big responsibility and indeed uh, authorities will have dedicated at least one person, sometimes a whole staffing section. Sometimes that's within the service, sometimes it's within corporate personnel. So part of a head teacher's anxiety and worry will be staffing. So there'll be regular visits to schools just to look at those issues. And the head teacher would be the first to know if somebody's uh, uh, going off on maternity leave or if there's an idea that somebody may or may not retire, albeit they might not formally inform the authority to the last minute, which is understandable, uh, and they'll plan on that basis, and they'll, be, they'll begin the search as soon as they know that a vacancy is about to arise, and, and they'll do it from within their own staff, they'll do it from in, within their own contacts. If that fails, there'll be a wider search, and quite often in the staffing round, those kind of issues are tackled before you start filling posts with probationers and new people. So there's a, kind of, there's a, a staffing timetable that starts with P1 enrolment and goes all the way through to August, ending up with uh, the actual staffing in the school. So those, those, are, those are dependent on uh, how much notice that the head teacher in the school gets. But that planning would start early, and they could be drawn from uh, in locally. Uh, they could be drawn from the supply pool, and if there's a permanent supply pool, you, you can do it that way. Often those those kind of known planned vacancies are filled before you get into uh, your, your probationer teachers, that you would take some of those, and then wider advert. Uh, so there's, there's almost like a, a set of Russian dolls of, of internal and wide, wider internal across the authority okay. before you go to external and try and, try and fill those posts. Sure. OK. I suppose um, on the topic of recruitment as well, one of the questions that they posed was why are they required to use the My Job Scotland portal? The example that was given was um, a small school had wanted to hire a support assistant and posting in My Job Scotland resulted in 300 applications for a job, which you know meant the, the recruitment process was pretty onerous for, for that. My job was set up principally to um, help councils cut costs in terms of, of um, advertising, particularly in teaching, but not restricted to teaching posts. Um, my job team in COSLA monitors this, uh, 
on a, a fairly regular basis and um, advertising, I think, and I'm looking at a, a document that I received from a colleague uh, last week that um, savings um, are significant um, in relation to this in terms of both print and, and online costs. Uh, the posts are not, and it depends, and it depends on the type of post it is. Um, my job has a, an engagement with uh, TESS, for example, on unpromoted posts, and that's taken down in no additional costs. So there, there, there's an opportunity there to further expand the, oper the, 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 um, the range of which um, posts are advertised. Other posts done through other online sites where there's no additional cost. And the point that I'm trying to make is that we're trying to save Council's money mm. by taking this, you know, taking it on through the portal. Um, we've also trying to develop um, a supply portal to tackle some of the other issues that we've already discussed this morning and to look at that in terms of both recruitment and, um, uh, and you know, regularly booking uh, supply uh, teachers for different posts. But it was done um, because it was a it was a cost saving to councils because the advertising costs through the, the print media um, mm. were becoming uh, unsustainable. Okay, thank you. Um, the next questions are for um, Education Scotland. Um, and I'll just use their phrasing, this is not mine. <laughs> um, do Education Scotland and SQA communicate with each other? No. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we do. Okay. Yes, there's a lot of um, very regular meetings. Naturally, it happens um, in, in, um, in different forums nationally where we have a local government um, ADES partners around the table here with, and often with SQA at various meetings, but also we have um, direct links through our um, team of curriculum experts. So our science sure. expert would be very closely connected to the, the science um, senior team. I, I suppose my question would be, why, why would a teacher think that, that you don't communicate well with SQA? Yeah, I'd be interested to explore that. It's not, um, not something no. you would recognise. No, it's not something that I would recognise from from our <coughs> discussions. Okay. Well. Another thing that, that came up was about um, the documents that are issued to teachers, and actually was mentioned um, by one of the panel members as well. Um, the question that the teachers have posed here is, do you consider that the documents issued to teachers um, suggest Education Scotland to teach, te uh, treat teachers as professionals? It's absolutely the intention ever since Curriculum for Excellence started. Um, the documents that, that we provide, and I, for example, I'll go back to um, the links with, with the SQA in there, that where there's a major change in, in any qualification, be it computer science, that just that could be changing because of the revised experiences and outcomes, or science in the past, then the materials that we provide are aimed at the professionals. They are not telling teachers what to do, Far from it. It's giving illustrative examples of the kind of approaches that, that can be taken, so they're not prescriptive. Is, is there a way that, that teachers can feed back to you how they are receiving? Yes, we, we, we actually have groups. If, if we have a, a programme, any programme of uh, support for literacy, numeracy or anything in there, there's always a feedback loop in there. If there's a development that we have ongoing, then there's, there's a feedback loop. But of course, there's a general inquiries email address on the website where anybody can. Okay, thank you. Very much, Ruth. Uh, uh, thank you very much for that. That brings us to the end of the first panel. So, thank you all for your attendance and uh, you, you're answering quite a number of questions. Thank you. I'll suspend for a couple of minutes to change panels.
welcome everybody back and we'll now move on to the second panel and I welcome Ken Muir, Chief Executive and Ellen Doherty, Director of Education, Registration and Professional Learning, both from the GTCS. I'm going to start by uh, just asking Daniel Johnson to begin the questioning on ITE. Of course. So uh, you'll no doubt be aware we've been spending the last few weeks looking at the quality of teacher education. I think our wider examination looked at curriculum for excellence. Given the, your role in accreditation, what, what are your reflections on, on how teacher training needs to adapt to curriculum for excellence and what are the lessons learned and how does that inform your accreditation process? Yeah, I think uh, I, I would go back to my previous experience as Chief Inspector of Education with Education Scotland, where we had the responsibility with Education Scotland, the legal responsibility to undertake the review of uh, initial teacher education programmes on an iterative basis at the Minister's behest. And I think we're talking now best part of about six or seven years ago where the uh, universities were approached by inspectors to look at their readiness for curriculum for excellence. And I think in this two-stage process that we undertook, initially they were not as well prepared as we might have hoped for. But the, at, at the second stage, which was about nine months later, they had shown significant improvement. And I think what we have seen is a genuine attempt by the university programmes to to meet the needs of uh, curriculum for excellence, a very complex and wide range of needs. Uh, that, that teachers require uh, uh, through their initial teacher education programme. So I, I would suggest that the universities have come a long way. That's not to say I think that the teacher education programmes necessarily cover wholly what is required in order to deliver curriculum for excellence successfully. But I think uh, we recognise from the schools and the implementation of curriculum for excellence that there is still a way to go in teachers' understanding the philosophy and the thinking behind curriculum for excellence in order that it can be implemented successfully. So in our evidence, we focused uh, quite extensively on literacy and numeracy. Do you think that's one of the areas that, that, that we need to have renewed focus? Yeah, I, I think it's important for a committee to understand that the teacher education programmes that General Teaching Council for Scotland accredits, they do it on a six-year basis. And I think a lot of the programmes that were being referred to by witnesses in the previous uh, hearings uh, were programmes that we probably accredited the best part four, five, six years ago. We have a fairly significant programme of re-accreditation coming up in the coming session. I would have to admit, I think that the focus on literacy, numeracy, perhaps even health and wellbeing, digital literacy, was less prominent when we accredited those programmes that many uh, students coming through the system have experienced. Last year, because of our expectations uh, and the, the feedback that we had from universities themselves, there was a, a strong sense that we needed to major much more during the accreditation process on the likes of literacy, numeracy, health and wellbeing uh, and uh, digital literacy. And the committee has a copy of the questions and the areas, the policy, in fact, on accreditation that we submitted as part of our submissions to you. And you'll see that literacy, numeracy, health wellbeing, digital literacy in particular feature much more prominently. And in this last year, uh, this last academic session, we have accredited a number of university programmes. And in some of those, we have commented on the need for them to focus more on aspects of literacy and numeracy and, and some elements within the curriculum for excellence uh, area. I think we also, uh, I think, encountered concern that, that perhaps what the the faculties were teaching was learning about learning rather than really uh, kind of helping uh, uh, student teachers develop technique. Would, is that a kind of a, a balance that you think needs to be looked at again? I mean, when, when we are accrediting programmes, we're looking for uh, a balance of theory and practice. And I think it's important to understand that particularly where we have a one-year postgraduate programme it is, in fact, one year, but it is then followed up with a, an induction year, a probationary year, which is wholly based in a school funded by the Scottish Government where the probationers receive a salary, which builds on the placement experiences that they would have had in their, their single postgraduate year. So uh, I think what we are looking for when we're accrediting a programme is to try and ensure that there is enough scope for teachers to understand the complexities of teaching, because we know it is not an easy job. There will be folks sitting around this table who will be teachers previously who know that. Uh, but at the same time, have enough 
uh, opportunity to develop that theory into practice and to be supported to do so through the teacher induction year, which is their probationary year. So in a sense, we have a two-year programme within Scotland in order to prepare teachers as best as possible for, uh, for becoming fully-fledged teachers. I've just got one last question. So you, you've pointed out that, that you're responsible for, for accreditation, um, and that's, that, that's obviously being looked at again for a number of institutions, given it's on a six-year basis. Do you think it's a, a, a weakness that you're responsible for accreditation, but for not then uh, uh, looking at the implementation which rests with Education Scotland? Do you think that should be brought under one body? I think there's certainly a disjoint there. Uh, the university programmes, before they come to GTC Scotland for accreditation, go through an internal university accreditation uh, process. So there's a QAA oversight of those programmes. Uh, as I said, ministers can uh, request HM inspectors to undertake a thematic aspect review of an element of teacher education. General Teaching Council for Scotland doesn't have that statutory responsibility. Well, I think in fairness, I would say that we do work very closely with the Scottish Council of Deans of Education and what was previously the uh, uh, STEC, which is Scottish Teacher Education uh, Council, uh, in taking feedback on the success or otherwise of the implementation of the the teacher education programmes, but there is undoubtedly a disjoint there between having a body that accredits, uh, but not necessarily having a quality assurance role in the implementation. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much, Daniel. Uh, Liz? Thank you. Um, Mr Muir, oh, may I declare an interest uh, convener as a registered member of uh, GTCS? Um, Mr Muir, one of the concerns that we've had, uh, given previous panels, is about the workforce planning issue and the fact that uh, students uh, have raised concerns that there is a lack of consistency in some of the delivery of uh, the programme. And we've obviously heard this morning that there seems to be some real issues about definitions of you know, that workforce planning in terms of uh, the numbers and w what they actually mean. W were you surprised to hear the evidence that came particularly from the body that we had two weeks ago who made pretty strong criticisms that for some workforce pl planning uh, in terms of student uh, trainees, it wasn't really working very well. Were you surprised by that? I was, and I mean, the General Teaching Council do uh, take feedback from students, and I have to say that uh, I was surprised, and I, I, I think our evidence would have suggested that there is a, a degree more positivity within the students than perhaps the uh, committee heard. I'm not denying in any way that the issues that were raised were perfectly valid uh, issues, but uh, I go back to the, the review of the impact of the Donaldson report, Teaching Scotland's Future, that was published last year, and there's a specific question asked about the extent to which uh, students felt that their initial teacher education programme adequately prepared them for moving into their probationary year. Now, the figure of 92% uh, response to that ITE year either having been effective or very effective would seem to suggest that there are, whilst there are undoubtedly individual teachers and students who have some difficulties with the system, that it's a system that, that in the main produces teachers who are as ready as they can be. And as you've heard before from uh, uh, from witnesses, you know, it's it's initial teacher education. It's called initial teacher education for a reason. It is initial teacher education, and I think, uh, particularly where there is a one-year postgraduate program, uh, then it is very difficult, and it is a demand on the universities to try and include as much as they as they can in a practical sense and making the, the link between the, the theories of teaching and learning and the practice in order to cover the full gamut and you know, additional support needs that Mr Beattie was referring to earlier. I think it's a good example of that. When you look at the range of additional support needs that teachers are confronted with in schools now, to adequate, adequately prepare a student teacher for that whole gamut of additional support needs it is a big ask. It's not to say that it shouldn't be touched on, and it is touched on undoubtedly within the initial teacher education programmes, but uh, I think that uh, the, we, we have a system which, yes, it could be much better, and I think there is certainly inconsistency, as the content analysis report showed just recently last week from Scottish Government around the coverage of aspects of literacy, numeracy, health and wellbeing. Uh, 
to some extent, I think that's what you, it's how you measure what is literacy, and numeracy, health, and well-being, which maybe gives some, uh, gives some of the reasons why there's such variation. But uh, I think what we have been going, we have done within the General Teaching Council for Scotland with the accreditation criteria, is to be able to identify literacy, numeracy, health, and well-being, digital technology as as, a, as something that does require more profile within the teacher education programmes and. From what we have seen in the five programmes that we've accredited this year, although we are giving some recommendations to some of those programmes to improve that, generally I think that has been taken on board uh, positively by the universities. Could I just follow up on the um, concerns that we had that the quality of some of the placement experience was very variable, um, notwithstanding the, the fact that many students were very positive about that placement. Yeah. Uh, there were other students who were making the case that they were simply used as cover, that they were used more or less to make the coffee, and that they, they didn't have a quality experience. Yeah. Now, if I'm right, one of the changes you've made in the GTCS is to move from an opt-in uh, system to an opt-out yeah. system. Could I, could I just clarify whether that opt-out will refer to an individual school? or whether it will refer to individual departments within that school. Because if I understood matters correctly, um, a couple of years ago we had problems with a lot of departments who were not accepting uh, trainees. And that's been part of the issue about this quality of experience. Could you just clarify that for us? And Ellen may want to say something uh, around this, but I'll maybe just start off by saying that uh, the student placement system, which the General Teaching Council operates on behalf of a partnership. It's a partnership between the schools, the local authorities and the universities. We operate the machinery. It is for those partnerships uh, between the schools, local authorities and universities to ensure that the, the information that goes into the system around the students, where they stay, where they're travelling from, whether they look at public transport or travelling by pri private transport, <coughs> uh, whether they're looking for a denominational uh, school and so on, it is a requirement on those partnerships to make sure that there are sufficient placements and that all of that data is accurate before it comes to the General Teaching Council. We simply crank the handle when those ingredients, if you like, have been put into it. And what comes out are the placements. Now, there is a, a student placement management group, which has got representation from all of the stakeholders. We also have a user group, which is largely made up of folk who operate the system at the sharp end. Uh, there are certainly a, a number of students who find out relatively late, because I recognise that as being one of the issues, uh, that they are being placed in a particular school. Uh, where we've got four-year students coming in in their first year and where we've got one-year postgraduate students uh, coming into teacher education, they may not find out that they are eligible to come onto that course until they've received their SQA results. Now, the SQA results come out at the end of the first week in August. The first placements that university, some university programmes uh, have in place take place at the end of August. Now, that gives us basically a two or three week window in which to, uh, the, for the universities to feed the, the information into the system and for the placements to be identified, for the schools then to confirm that those placements are still valid for the local authorities to confirm that they're content with them, uh, and for that information to be sent out to, uh, to, to uh, the, the student concerned. So I think we've made fairly substantial steps on the back of last year to, imp to improve the system so that uh, folk find out as early as they possibly can. And one of the changes this year that the management group have made is to run the whole set of 18,000 placements for the whole year at the beginning of the year. Last year, we divvied it up by term, and that caused more problems probably than it solved. But effectively, the system, if the data, if the ingredients coming into our machinery are accurate, and there are enough placements agreed between the schools, the local authorities, and the universities, and these are prerequisites before they come in, then we can produce 18,000 perfectly valid placements which agree within the protocols that have been set. And I know travel time has been an issue and some folk complaining about the amount of time. Uh, I <coughs> Liz wants to come back on that. Yeah. Okay. It's, it's, it's related to, to this problem about accuracy of data. Because I think, that, I mean, the, the bottom line that we're obviously concerned about as a committee is that we have a shortage of teachers. And 
uh, there are people out there who would like to be able to teach, um, but for one reason or another, they feel that there are constraints within the system uh, that are preventing them um, being in the classroom. And th this morning, I, I was concerned from the previous panel that nobody's quite able to explain exactly um, why these barriers are in place. Um, and what I'm driving at is that what do we have to do to ensure that all those teachers who are validly accredited and who want to teach are actually able to do so? Where is, in your opinion, where is the, 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 the blocking in the system that is preventing more people coming into the teaching profession and ensuring that we get them into uh, a very good job? Where are the blocks? Well, I think you know, the committee itself has heard evidence around the, the status of the teaching profession. I think that is an issue. I think some of the negativity that's in the press and media around teaching is certainly a block. I think there's uh, a need to look at greater flexibility. It was picked on earlier on uh, to allow folk to have more flex in terms of how they train to become uh, a teacher. Uh, a good example of that would be the teacher induction scheme that we have, which covers the probationary year. There are blocks within that in that it only is uh, allowed for those who fulfil it on a full-time basis, uh, and it's only home-funded students who are eligible for it. We know, and GTC Scotland has been doing a lot of work over the last two years uh, with uh, jurisdictions in other parts of the world to try and encourage teachers uh, to come to Scotland. Uh, we know from the survey that we did, and members have got a copy of it, the UK CORD research into those who have lapsed from the register last year. Uh, one of the reasons for that was simply that uh, folk uh, were unable to uh, secure a job in Scotland uh, or had been trained in Scotland being an overseas student, and then the, the, the immigration and visa requirements meant that they couldn't then continue their, uh, their, their job. So I think there's, there's something around greater flexibility in allowing folk into the teaching profession to, meet, to better meet their needs. It's no longer the traditional model that you come in as a full-time student and that uh, you fulfil a year's or four-year programme. I think we need to look at ways in which we can offer more flexibility for teacher education programmes and also for folk who wish to change career who want to come into the teaching profession. Because, again, that's never really been uh, a major issue where we've had a surplus of teachers in the past. Uh, can, I, can I just say, I personally think there are issues about immigration and they're not helpful. Um, but I think there are other issues too that we, we do have teachers who are perfectly well qualified and very experienced from other jurisdictions who would like to teach in Scotland and we want to encourage that system and, and you know there is anecdotal evidence out there that some schools are finding it very difficult to get these uh, people accredited and I'm just interested to know I mean I know you've done quite a lot of work already to try and prove this but you know we're in a situation of teacher shortages and I think it's absolutely vital that we free up those who are properly accredited I think it's absolutely right that it is a properly accredited profession um, but that they are able to teach in Scotland. Well, I know Ellen and our team have been doing a lot of work on the registration of teachers to try and uh, increase that flexibility. She may want to say something around that. I think, too, just going back to an earlier point you made there, um, there's also those who would want to return to teaching. I'm always interested to hear, particularly those who around year five have decided it's time to have their family, which is absolutely great. It's keeping a number of children in Scotland schools up the way that we would want them to be. But actually, that maternity leave can turn into a career break and the curriculum moves on um, and teachers then don't want to feel as if they don't know. So one of the barriers is what is available to support them to return to teaching. And these are people that the Scottish education system have already invested in. And so we need that support. Um, Edinburgh University has already designed a return to teaching programme, which is now going to be disseminated nationally. And I think that's a way of bringing what we have is already some resource available to us uh, mm -hmm. for them to come back. I think, too, in terms of the diversity in Scottish teaching, that's important. And that includes those who work abroad or work out with Scotland as well. And there is a qualification framework that is there uh, underpinning the work um, of the GTC, um, I would say to committee, is quality. The children in Scotland really deserve the very best. So part of our job is to identify that quality and look at qualifications 
or to help people on their way to coming into the profession. So as Mr Muir has already suggested, we have moved on as an organisation, moving away from just the full registration that you would expect from a Scottish university, finally, to looking at the qualifications that people are bringing from out with Scotland and giving them provisional conditional registration, which means that they are coming with some of the base requirements, but there is a learning gap and we're setting up programmes for professional learning to allow them to be in our schools, but to maintain that quality at the same time. So we now have a full range of registration categories. Full registration, provisional registration for probationers, provisional conditional registration for those who are coming from abroad as well. And that includes provisional conditional registration for those who may wish to move from the college sector into the secondary sector. And that's a way that we have moved to help those who in college bring STEM expertise. And committees heard this morning there is a shortage there to take that expertise, particularly in vocational education subjects, and to help the school system. So we are actively looking, not at a deficit model, but we're looking at what people can bring. We're looking at that as learners, and we're actually looking at quality. My last point, how, how many um, possible teachers, potential teachers, are on your books just now who are awaiting accreditation um, because they have come from another jurisdiction? Please. I think that we can supply definitive numbers of that because they change day and daily and happy to provide that to committee. But I'm able to say that um, from helpful. January this year, um, throughout the number of registrations that we have had to take forward is about 452. Okay. Be helpful to get that. Thank you, Claire. You. And I wanted to ask a, a, a question specifically on some of the information that you gave in reply to, to Liz Smith um, about uh, placements and student placements and the difficulties that we heard about in terms of people being told quite late in the in the piece where they were going. Um, how long have you been running education and postgraduate education so throughout throughout Scotland? In terms of DGTE? the student placement system. Yes. Yeah, this is our this is our uh, third year okay. uh, of it. And how long have universities known when SQA puts out their exam results and people find out when they're going to university at the start of August? How long has that system been in place? Well, I, I think that what, what I was talking about were students who are awaiting uh, confirmation that they've been accepted Absolutely. for, for so a teacher education programme. Absolutely. How long has, it, program. has that system been in place? Because from my understanding, it's quite some years. I would, yes, it has. And you know, it's no different to uh, many other applicants for university programmes who, who wait until the SQA results come out at the beginning of August to know if they've been accepted for a programme that might start in September. The issue with the student placement system is that the placement patterns uh, that the universities have uh, some of those placement pa patterns, as I say, this, this coming year will start on the 29th and the 30th of August. So, if why? Well, I think it's an interest. It's a good question, but one of the one of the uh, questions that we ask uh, of the programmes that we are now accrediting under the new accreditation criteria is: Do those programmes uh, allow for uh, them to be contained within the student placement system in a way that is practical and? doesn't create the kind of difficulties that we've had in the last few years. Uh, but what would, be, what would be needed in order to change that would be a different placement pattern or a different time of placement starting within uh, the universities. I mean, there are some universities that don't start their placements until September, and you know, there's one in particular that doesn't start their placements until uh, January. But I think uh, you know, that, that would be more a question for the universities in terms of what it is they are looking for in their, in their uh, programme and how they balance up the delivery of the theory with the, with the practice uh, on placement. But surely, if, if you're the organisation that has the oversight of that, why then are you allowing universities to have placements at the end of August, which are just logistically impractical, when other ones are able to schedule their programme that they, you know, they have three, four, five months lead in? Yeah, I, I wouldn't say they're impractical. I think for some individuals it is. Uh, uh, but as I said, one of the things that we have 
uh, we are asking the, the universities now when we're accrediting the programmes, now that we have the student placement system, is that very issue. Is it feasible, given the placement pattern that's being expected within this programme, is it feasible that it fits into uh, the student placement system in a way that it doesn't create difficulties or some of the difficulties that we've had in the past? Uh, do you want to come in here, yeah, just, I mean, to make the point that concerns about late notification weren't just for the first term, it was actually throughout the, the student experience. So I wondered whether, um, I wondered whether, in the process, you're recognising the change in nature of a, a, a student in initial teacher education. That is, it may be folk who are older and have got family mm -hmm. responsibility. Yeah. Is, is, are these factors properly? fed into, I accept you're just running a machine, but it's what you put into the machine to whether it's yeah. effective or not. So, you know, late notification is a huge difference if you've got family responsibilities or whatever than if you don't. And I wonder whether that flexibility across the student bodies is allowed for in the process. Yeah, I, I think uh, when the system operates, there is always the opportunity uh, when we produce the placements uh, for the universities or the schools to reject that placement. And often when we find that universities reject placements, <coughs> it's because of personal circumstances. So we're not, we're not at the initial stage of putting the ingredients into our machinery asking uh, about uh, whether they have, for example, caring arrangements or if they, if they have uh, family that circumstances. Makes, that not make and that feels that you're, you're building in a delay then. If I've got a young family, I am not going to be able to do a placement that involves an hour and a half travel in both directions yeah, by public transport, say. It just, I'm physically not going to be able to do it. Surely it must be possible, if you want me to come into teaching as an older person with experience, to, to minimise the barriers, given that we already had evidence about the fact that people have to give up their jobs, they have to uh, have no salary for a year or whatever unless mm -hmm. they want a special programme. Are you looking at developing a system that is as sensitive as that, rather than at the next stage you have to say, well, I can't do that, which creates a lot of tension and stress for everybody yeah, involved? I, I think that there, there, there are a couple of answers to that. I mean, one is there is flexibility in that the universities who know the individual students uh, can uh, reject the, the, the placement that's been offered and can uh, put in a placement that's more appropriate uh, to the, the needs of, of that individual. The system doesn't do that from the off. But, Should it? Uh, well, I think, it, I think we could certainly look at it. And as I say, it's been something that the uh, management group that's overseeing it has, has considered, because we do, we do recognise that uh, when placements are rejected, it tends to be for those very personal, uh, family-related uh, circumstances. In terms of the travel time, again, that's been agreed. That 90-minute uh, uh, travel time protocol <coughs> was agreed with the universities as, as being an appropriate time. The average travel time for students using SPS is 28 minutes. Uh, and that's not to say there aren't some for whom they're much closer to uh, the 90 minutes. But uh, I think it's something that the programme management group uh, is aware of. And you know, as, as, the, as the organisation that turns the handle, then we'd be as keen as any to make sure that the placements are as sensitive as possible. But mentors? Yeah. Um, the other issue that, um, um, thank you for that, I and mean, I think it would be worthwhile reflecting on you know, yeah. these concerns, cutting out slack in the system because you wait until somebody rejects it when they know at the beginning what their, what their capabilities are. But I wonder, do you monitor closely um, this question of mentoring, given it's such a significant part yeah. of the course that you're effectively mentored in, in schools? There's some evidence, not that folk were criticising staff, but they just recognised there's so much else going on, it's very difficult for them to do that job properly. And have you thought about proposals to kind of protect the mentor role so that it is it's a, such a, an important change, I think, yeah. in the experience of teachers yeah. that they have got a proper mentoring role over probation, but are you, is that something you're looking at? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, Mr Muir referred to the recently accredited programmes, and that has got a lot of attention. Um, in the probation year, uh, clearly there's time set aside, uh, which is formal, for mentoring. In the student year, not so much so. And in looking at the programmes, we are actively asking the universities um, how are mentors being decided for students in school? And equally, um, making the point that um, mentoring 
is a particular role and that the individuals who are chosen to take forward that role, do they have the skills and abilities to be able to lay those foundations very strongly at the beginning? Um, we have got some work going on with some of the universities where, in fact, they've developed modules to support mentors, both for students and probationers, over the piece, so that that quality of mentoring is actually improved across the piece. So we're actually working on that, and we know the influence that that can have to a good beginning. OK, thank you. Thank you very much, Ross. Thanks, convener. I'll just be brief, conscious of, of time, but uh, going back to your comments, uh, Ken, on additional support needs, we absolutely agree that with the incredibly broad spectrum of needs that there are there, that every uh, teacher cannot uh, get that full gambit of knowledge in their initial, initial teacher education. But from the evidence that we've had so far, the level of inconsistency between universities and between courses on this is incredible. I mean, we shouldn't take anecdotal evidence as gospel, but there was one bit that came to us where uh, they said that it was simply a, an optional module in the fourth year, which seemed completely inadequate. Surely it's your role to ensure that there is at least a higher minimum standard that all these courses are reaching. Yeah, it is. And we try to do that through the accreditation process. And uh, I mean, one of the things that we do make very clear when we're accrediting programmes is that if there are any electives or options or modules that are not part of the mainstream programme, uh, then they need to look co closely at whether they, they should in fact be. And additional support needs is a good example. And if you look at the criteria, you'll see very clearly there's a strong expectation that those programmes uh, contain enough of a baseline of coverage of additional support needs so that teachers, when they're going out into the classes, either as students on <coughs> placement or in their probationary year, are getting... Uh, enough experience and support to try and deal with, at the very least, the mainstream uh, areas of uh, additional support needs. But do you recognise that a lot of the evidence we've received would indicate that that's not happening, not consistently? I think it's, it's perhaps not, it's not as consistent as, uh, as it might be, and I think that's been shown in the, uh, in the content analysis report and certainly in some of the evidence. Uh, I think we need to remember that, as I said, initial teacher education in the probationary year is really just the, the beginnings of a career for teachers. Uh, and I think that we need to look perhaps more closely at how those newly qualified teachers are supported beyond the probationary year. Because, you know, as a teacher myself, uh, there would be youngsters coming into my classrooms uh, who who brought particular difficulties that I wasn't exposed to either through teacher education or in my probationary year. So there is something about that ongoing engagement that teachers have in their own professional learning to get to understand and see in a practical sense how they can deal with some of these youngsters who are bringing increasingly complex needs into the classroom. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Claire, do you have more questions though? Uh, it was just very briefly about flexibility. We'd heard from, I'd asked our last panel about flexibility in the probation year, and I wonder if you could perhaps comment on how you see your role in terms of ensuring there is some flexibility to retain some of the teachers who, uh, like uh, Joanne Lamont had been talking about, perhaps have more caring commitments or other commitments outside of the profession. Uh, no, I think we are certainly considering that um, in terms of where we can support teachers I think the, the nature of the teacher population is changing and those who are coming into teaching is changing and therefore we need to be more sensitive to that. So you will know the design of probationer year at the moment and we're reflecting on could that be delivered on a part-time basis, for example? Could it be delivered more flexibly over a two-year period, for example, as well, at areas that we're looking at? Equally to, for those who do probation, you can go in and do the induction year, which is the standard approach, but for some circumstances, don't allow them to do that. And they go the flexible route, which takes a longer period of time to do and with less support. We're very aware of the, the inequality of the experience there. And there's some significant piece of work being carried out at the GTC to equalise that, both in terms of mentoring uh, and in terms of the support those individuals get uh, to retain them into the profession and make sure we maintain the standard. And I could just add, I mean, one of the projects that we are involved in just now is uh, an EU project on uh, distance learning based ITE programmes because I think we recognise, particularly in some of the rural areas where it's more difficult to access teacher education, that we perhaps need to look a bit more at 
distance learning as being a mechanism, particularly for the theory aspect of initial teacher education. And Ellen has been doing some work on this uh, European group as part of this project to look at what are the ups and what are the downsides in moving to some element of, or some greater element of distance learning within ITE programmes. And that certainly would open up some of the flexibility that uh, you know, we know is required within the system now. And watch. And finally, uh, Ruth, you've got a couple of questions from the teachers. Thanks, Convener. These are um, questions from the teachers in our focus group. Um, the first one is, why is the amount of paperwork or online work increasing to verify teachers' actions? Um, the suggestion was that teachers should be trusted to meet the standards and subject to peer assessment and, and line management rather than... I'll take this one. OK. okay. Yeah, I mean, I think what, what's being referred to there is the requirement to have a teacher's professional learning signed off every five years as, as part of professional update. Uh, and that was something that was required of us by Scottish Government. And we've worked very closely with the professional associations to, to make this a success, and it has been a success. Uh, it's a system which requires teachers to log into an electronic system. Uh, and record the professional learning uh, and to consider the impact of that professional learning. That is no different from any other profession uh, in terms of what we're expecting of teachers. We have an annual evaluation exercise that we undertake on professional update. And what we're finding is that, and we do investigate all of the queries that come in, that concerns that are expressed, and very few of them are around the system itself that we operate. Very often what we find is that it's perhaps the broadband width or it's the infrastructure within the school or within the local authority that uh, doesn't allow them to access their MyGTCS account as readily as they might. I was in a primary school in Glasgow not that long ago where a head teacher said to me at the beginning of lunchtime, I'm just going to switch on my computer so that I can access the internet by the end of lunchtime. Now, these are the kind of issues that uh, teachers face. We get it in the neck in GTC Scotland because we operate the system. It's a bit like SPS in a sense. Uh, but the, the truth of the matter is when you investigate why teachers have found difficulty uh, with the system, it's very often not because of any bureaucracy or anything. It's getting logged onto the system and using the system and the restriction is, is not one of our system, but it's one of the, the internet and broadband width, et cetera, which, you know, covers other aspects of life as well. OK, thank you. I'm not sure how that question answered, that, that answer answered the question, really. <laughs> uh, because it was a question of why don't you trust us? I suppose, yeah, there was, there was elements of that. I suppose, I mean, what's, what is your reflection on, you know, them using peer assessment? Oh. It, oh, that's, that's a slightly different question, but I mean, on the area of trust convener, I mean, I think part of our role in the General Teaching Council for Scotland is to support and promote teacher professionalism, and you know, embedded within that is is the value of trust, and you know, we we absolutely uh, feel that the the profession should be trusted. It should, it perhaps should be better understood in terms of the complexity of what it delivers for youngsters, for communities, for society generally. Uh, and you know, the council, general teaching councils, council absolutely place huge amounts of trust in the teaching profession. And part of uh, Ms. Maguire's question was around uh, professional learning, and the, uh, you know, we we are trusting <coughs> teachers to engage meaningfully in professional learning and keeping their skills up to date to meet with the changing needs that youngsters have. Well, then, just to follow on from that, well, how do you make it clear to the teachers that you trust them? Because there, does, there, there was coming across in that focus group that, that uh, Ruth and I met that they had this feeling that they were treated like children and not well, not not like each other. That's not fair, but not like professionals. And and they, how do you get that message across to them that you what you've just told us is how you feel about them? Well, hopefully, they don't feel that because of anything that the General Teaching Council for Scotland does. I mean, I think there is an issue, a wider issue in the system about professional trust in teachers. Uh, and uh, you know, part of our role is actually to. Uh, to, to encourage the public to have trust in the quality of the teachers that are teaching children in schools these days. Uh, uh, but I think there is a wider issue about the extent to which uh, 
society at large views teaching and uh, has absolute trust in, in teachers. Certainly, there would be no, be no question of the General Teaching Council not having respectful trust in the job that teachers do. Okay, thank you very much. That brings us to the end of the evidence session. And can I thank you both very much for the, your attendance and the, answering the questions. Uh, so, thank you. <coughs> The next item of business is consideration of a draft annual report. Do members have any comments on the annual report? Okay, uh, thank you very much. We will form. Yeah, too, too late, you missed your opportunity. Page one. I have a feeling under membership changes that that date that Richard Lockhead replaced Jenny Gilruth may not be correct. September 2017. Yeah, you may well be right. Uh, but of course, that will be changed very quickly. And is that the only change that you thing. noticed? Yes. Well, it must be correct then. Thank you very much. Uh, and in that case, once that dreadful error has been corrected, we will formally, formally publish the report before the end of the month. Uh, uh, next item of business is on witness expenses for the school infrastructure inquiry. Are members content to delegate sign off of any witness expenses to me? Yes. Yes. Thank you. And that brings us to the end of the public part of the meeting, and I will wait for the gallery to clear. <laughs> <laughs> Could take some time. Thank you.